the director will give you a cue. Hello, this is Ham Radio Now, episode 374, Chicago Marathon Man. Where's the lower third? Nope. I'm trying. It's, it's not <laughs> cooperating. There, there it is. is. Whoosh. I said whoosh. I don't know how to run it's, this thing. It's okay. There you go. <laughs> There you go. MCOM Extra 19, episode number 374, Chicago Marathon Man, with guest Rob Orr. Ham Radio Hello. Now, the most important ham radio show on the internet. I'm David Goldenberg, W0DHG, and my co-host, Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Hi, Gary. I'm not 100% sure if we're going to go right to Rob or we're going to talk about some of the other stuff we just talked about. Oh, that's right. I guess I got to appear for that, don't I? Yeah, there's Gary. So we're, Hi, Gary. We're trying to make this David show here. Yeah, yeah. So. We should have we should have pre rolled this a little <laughs> bit more. That's all right. That so would, we're going to bring Robin in. We're going to bring Robin in a minute. But I know um, we actually got some kudos, or at least a call okay. out, in the latest edition of QRZ. QST. QST, yeah, QST. Right, that's the <laughs> QRZ is a website. That's that's the website. QST. We got some. We got we got a little traffic there too. QST is a giant magazine. Tom Gallander actually called Gary out without calling Gary out. He he For, came close. So he, well, he. <laughs> I, this, I think he. I think he knew. Honestly, this, I think he knew. He must have known. This is yep. the um, the editorial <clears throat> from the January issue of QST. And it, it for for years and years and years the editorial was called "It Seems to Us," mm -hmm. and it is now the second century. The second century. That's so, great. So notice that title, NCIS Newington. Notice this title. Yep. And uh, so now I will attempt to zoom in on the bottom here. I really don't like the way this works on the web. Yeah, uh, there were there there were a whole bunch of people complaining in my last Aries meeting about the um, the e reader for um, QST. Yeah, it's not bad on my uh, tablet. But all right, and I want to read this out loud for you and to whichever of the pundits in the crowd coined the phrase NCS Newington. I thank you. I liked it. Okay, let me point this out one more time. There it is. Yeah, bring it out 365. <laughs> NCIS Newington, QST, whichever of the pundits. Do you remember a recent episode when we were going, when we were talking about those guys? Yeah. All those references to those guys or that yep. guy. It's us. God well, damn it. Yes, it is. And you know what? Honestly, Here, it's us. It's David Goldenberg and Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, it is freaking us. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, Gary, there is not one of the other shows that I can think of that I watch, and I watch or listen to most of them. Anybody calls themselves pundits except us. <laughs> <laughs> it's us. It's us. And, and thank you, Tom. And yeah. you're welcome. <laughs> yes. He, he says thank you. He liked it. He did. Now, he didn't watch the show. No, somebody told him about it. Yeah. And well, and we probably are enough of a burr in his side that he won't give us full credit. That, but, could, that could be these days. Boy, am I getting a lot of comments and mail on the uh, code of conduct I, thing. I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a thing. Yep, it will be a thing. I, I did um, have a, a brain brainstorm or brain freeze, I'm not sure which, earlier today that I'll just mention quickly. Because you remember in some of the phrasing of the uh, Code of Conduct, it says that the Board of Directors has a fiduciary responsibility, mm -hmm. and which means you know, money. Fiduciary is just money Yep. yep. To, to make sure that what they do makes the league successful. Doesn't lose the money, gains the money if possible, doesn't lose. And it's pretty much members, sponsors, things like that. Mm -hmm. So what has all this done 
what have you been seeing? I don't, I don't know what you've been seeing. What I've been seeing is just scads of, of members saying, I'm quitting. Yeah. And, you know, we, we pushed really hard to say, don't, don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. In fact, I've been pushing folks that aren't members to join. Yeah. So that, you know, we can direct things the right direction. Yep. But what I'm thinking of, my brain freeze was um, that if this code of conduct and the, the director's inability to communicate with us about something, once it's been voted on, they can talk to us all they want when something is up for discussion. Not that that ever really happens. How often does it, have you been to a meeting where a director showed up and said, let's talk about this next policy? Uh, never. Hamfest forum. Yeah, right. Ba but barely. They, I mean, they kind of mumble out what the policy is and yep. maybe says somebody says something about it unless it's this one, this code of well, conduct. That, that yeah. one, that got their yep. attention out there. Well, and it got my director in trouble, a lot of trouble. Yeah. So m my point is that them not being able to talk about things is getting them in trouble and losing the members. And mm -hmm. so if they've got a fiduciary responsibility it might be to talk to us after mm -hmm. something has been, quote, decided, unquote, because nothing's ever in stone. Votes can be taken to change things. And after something has, has been decided, that could be when people are going to start talking about it. And if that is not the time for a director to have to shut up. Right. And, and sadly, the way it's written now, they can talk to us all they want as long as they support what the board did. Well, yeah, and they can't talk about the pros and cons. Right. Only, only, only the support part. Yeah. And, and we will be back after the first of the year because there's a bunch of elections coming up and we might be able to um, sway the vote to get rid of this. Yep. Facebook decided I didn't really need to be looking at what I was looking at. <laughs> and it Did sent, you lose it? It sent me somewhere else. I'm trying yeah. to get it back. Facebook will do that sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's my point. This fiduciary responsibility part, that it doesn't only work with shut up. It could also work with talk, and it appears as if talk is a more important part of their fiduciary responsibility. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think from talking to some of the folks that I could talk to that they can talk to us as long as it's, yes, we like what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I hate For now. I hate Facebook. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's usually why I manage the Facebook. All right. So... <laughs> Have we covered enough of this? Yes. I, I'm going away. I'm turning off my mic oh, and switching off my picture. It is your show. Here you go. Here's the David show. Hi, this is the David show. Well, so we should transition now to our guest, uh, Rob Orr. Hi, Rob. Good evening. How are you guys doing? We're doing really well. Rob is a K9 RST, and you're from... Tell us where well, you are. Well, I'm basically right now we're in Chicago, Illinois. I'm in Glenview, a suburb north of Chicago. And it's uh, about 20 degrees, 25 degrees outside. So it's a little chillier than your place. I bet it is. Yeah, I'm wearing short sleeves and it's uh, <laughs> the mid-70s right now. Yeah. So it's, so it's winter here. Yep. Yep. And we're, we'll get there soon enough. But in Los Angeles, it's a very different winter. So... Um, Rob's been volunteering. How long have you been volunteering with the Chicago Marathon? So th this is our 10th year doing this uh, event. Uh, and and uh, there's a kind of a history to how we got into it because it was not something I, I was looking to do, to be honest with you. <laughs> None of us were. But uh, history sort of pulled us up. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go into that now or not. But uh, no, that, that, Actually, that would be great. So how, how, how did you get there? So we started uh, in, in, basically in 2007. They had a horrific event. Uh, they, they, it was a very hot for runners uh, in the 90s, very high humidity, as Chicago sometimes gets, and they had to stop the race. And uh, several people were injured in the course of the, that race. I think one person actually did die, um, and they stopped the race. And after the race was over, uh, they had to sit down and, and think through how they did at closing the race down and realized they made a lot of mistakes, that there were a lot of issues that they never really thought through very well. So one of those was to get ham radio folks involved. It turns out that almost every major marathon had a ham person somehow involved with it. And the Chicago Marathon was one of the few that had. Uh, it turns out there, they were once a long time ago when it was first run by Mayor Daly back in the early days, but the hams got up and walked out and left. And uh, that turned out to be a good circumstance for us in the sense that it allowed us to come back at the event and redefine our purpose, because there are a lot of marathons where we got involved with it 
early on in these events and were really too entwined with the mechanics of, of running the event. So that allowed us to really, you know, focus on the parts that I think ham radio does best, which is primarily supporting the medical teams, health and welfare traffic. So, so you said initially you guys were involved or ham radio was involved in the, in the race and at some point it stopped. Do you, do you know why that happened? Well, you know, I, I don't know the politics of what went on back in those days, but, you know, I, I have to tell you that there have been a lot of events where I've been involved where the hams get uppity and just pick up their stuff and leave. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, as a community, it's a, it's a barrier that we've created for ourselves because we tend to, th- at those days, we used to think we were the only ones that could do the game in town, so it's our way or the highway. Uh, in fact, I still hear stories from some of my colleagues at the Chicago Marathon telling them stories about what ham radio people have demanded that they give them uh, in exchange for the service that they provide. I'm talking about, you know, like a helicopter service or, you know, special meals. Uh, we, we we didn't approach this at all. We, we approached this as a customer service relationship. Uh, right. We're there to help you. You tell us what you need. Uh, we're, we put no demands on them at all. We provide our own food, provide our own shelter, uh, our own radios, our own water, because um, that felt that that's what we needed to do to, to, to redefine how we came at this thing as a, as a true public service. Uh, and I think that's been a successful formula. I think they've come to, re, they, they come to trust us and, uh, and, and rely on us now. I mean, in fact, it's, uh, we, we can't provide enough hams for them. We had 140 hams last year. And uh, we could use another thirty or so, you know. So it's it's been it's been a good it's been a good run, but it's taken a long time for us to define where where we fit into the in, into the thing. Uh, we we went off and benchmarked a bunch of other marathons early on, and went and saw the the Marine Corps Marathon or the Minneapolis Marathon. Every one of them used hams in a different way, um, so ours is unique to those things. But uh, but and I think you know the way we do it is 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 probably the right way for us to do it, I suppose. Well, yeah. Well, you know, so let's talk about what's unique. So what is the service that you provide to the marathon? So on our course, we have, uh, on course, we have 20 medical tents that are an, um, about a mile and a half apart. Mm-hmm. Inside each one of those, there's a complete medical team of close to 15 to 20 people. Um, those folks provide services to the runners who come through that may have injuries from as simple as you're needing a Band-Aid, broken legs, to a heart attack. And usually, at most of them, there's an ambulance that's also staged there. Uh, this aid station is at the beginning of the aid station where they can get water and some refreshments if they need it. So it's usually the first point of contact for the runner who's in, in trouble. And obviously, as you get further into the course, uh, there's more, more demands for these kind of services. Um, what we provide is uh, the communication link. Well, one of the things the marathon found early on is that doctors don't want to communicate over the radio. They don't want to hold a radio. They want to talk to anybody on the radio. They want to deal with patients. Mm-hmm. So um, that that was like, you know, open door, we slipped in because that's, that's what we do. We don't want to handle patients. We want to help communicate. So uh, we have a team typically of four people at each age station, uh, one who is just assigned to, to follow the doctor, the top doc in that tent, and help him communicate with either needs for uh, an ambulance if the one they had had to go and they need another one, uh, which happens often, um, or if they need more supplies, um, we help provide communication for that. Or if they need to talk to the what we call the top doc, the guy who's in charge of the whole event, if they need to talk to him and get some kind of advice about how to handle things, sometimes uh, we, we help provide that kind of communication. We have two streams that we provide. We provide a medical stream, which is for medical emergency if you need an ambulance or transport of some kind. And the other stream is situational awareness, uh, information, uh, things like how well are you guys handling the event? Are you overwhelmed? Do you have too many people? Do you have enough doctors to handle what's going on? Um, To things like uh, maybe they need the fire hydrants opened up or maybe they have crowd control issues and they need to talk to the police. So we we provide a, a direct link from that aid station back to the headquarters so that we can provide the support the doctors are looking for. And then there's also logistic things, like how do you get the doctors there and how do you get them picked up? The hams are the first guys on and the last guys to leave, so they have somebody that they can serve as a, as a communication link for this, for this event. That's great. So, um, you know, based on my experience from running some of these events, you guys are there early enough to set up the tents initially and, 
and run all those things, or, or are they already there for you ahead of time? No, you know, we early on we, we tried to co-locate with the with the tents, and it's really mm-hmm. just too much. So a lot of guys build improvised shelters, or they'll bring a pop up themselves. Uh, a lot of guys get there so early that because th- this takes over the entire city. Yep. So as you get to the back end of the course, you know, near the end, those stations don't get set up until just before the race starts. So oftentimes the hams are there before anybody else is there. Um, and they now they know the routine, so they know where to put their tents and how to get set up. Um, but basically, these these aid stations, by the way, are massive things. They're, they're almost a block and a half or two blocks long. They're they're very very extensive things. And I, I, there's a picture earlier on there. I saw uh, two semi trucks come to each rest station and drop off the supplies they need. And you know they have everything on pallets and forklifts and ice machines and water bottles and all the supplies they need to support that station you know basically are at the aid station and of course the tents come up from another source all this stuff is deployed within hours before the race and it's all taken down as the as the race goes through the city and the city is opened up again they all are ripped down so it's a it's a real challenge to get up and running and out uh you know it, i mean that's the thing that makes the event sort of fun i think is that you're able to you know it's going to end <laughs> at some point usually right. you know but there, there's a lot of uh improvising and, and setting up right away this this picture you just saw there was a shot of uh, guys who have their own tent that they set up and we've been fortunate we haven't had really horrible weather yet but uh one day that'll happen this is a typical shot of the runners the chicago marathon is is sort of famous because uh it's one of the top five in the world and runners like to come here because it's uh got a flat course throughout the whole place and um so that a lot of people come here to because they, that gives them some pretty good times that they can use to qualify for some of the other events um but it's it's one of the elite, so we attract a lot of elite runners. That's a whole other category of how to support those guys in a in a race. That's one of our ham radio guys there, who's um, is another picture of a, of a team set up with their improvised shelter. You see how that's set up there with the tarps and things like that. So, so when you guys you guys show up, you know, four four or five people per aid station. How many how many other staff do you think are there? You know, if you look at a single aid station, you know, a mile and a half separated from. You know, the one before and the one after there's, there's, you know, medical folks, there's probably race officials. How, how many people are there with you? All right. So at the, at the medical tents, the first thing, and I said there was four ham radio operators. We have sometimes as many as eight at some of these stations farther on where it gets more complicated. Mm-hmm. In fact, one station has as many as 20. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, in the tent, we have uh, the medical team, doctors, nurses, massage therapists. We even have some psychologists now in some of the sites um, mm-hmm. that, that are helping that. Once you get past that stream, there's about 300 people who now are in the rest area itself, uh, supplying the water to the runners or providing whatever they need as support. Usually it's a little food here or there, mostly water, Gatorade, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of people uh, on the course that are uh, supporting that aid station. So that's 300 people times 20. It's a lot of folks. I mean, they have mm-hmm. 20,000 volunteers that help with this thing. There's 1,500 medical people. Uh, we had, as I said, 140 ham radio operators last year. So, uh, so 20,000 20, volunteers, is that what you said? 20,000 20, volunteers. How many, um, how many runners? Well, last year we had the highest we've had in a long time because it was their 40th anniversary. So they had 45,000 runners. Wow. So, so there's what? about two volunteers per runner. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, other other events. Uh, you know, they'll have forty five thousand people sign up, but only thirty five actually run the race because of the weather yep. or whatever. Right. But uh, last year they actually had almost forty five thousand runners, so it was it was pretty good race. I, I don't know. I think Mar- I think uh, New York might be bigger, uh, uh, but I, I don't know the numbers right off the bat. I can't compare the races, but they're all about the same size. You know that way. So, and what specifically robs your role? What, where where are you while well, this is all going on? So so my job uh, starts really before the race even begins, collecting all the hams that we need and getting folks trained. So that that's a huge part of my job. Uh, plus, I work with a medical team to really understand how we failed or succeeded last year and how we can do better. So there are a lot of meetings before we go into the, the race, before we even recruit people to talk about how we can improve what we did from the year before. And we've made vast improvements year to year. And so, uh, in fact, that one of the things that's great about working with the Chicago Marathon particularly is that they have a they have a commitment to excellence that has driven us, I think, to a level ourselves, which has been a lot of fun uh, to kind of meet that bar. Um, when I, the, the race day itself, I, I, uh, 
Well, by the way, in that pregame stuff, I have a small team of folks that work with me. There's a, another gentleman who has a club on the south side of Chicago, and the two of us sort of are the co-leads at the beginning of this thing of just collecting people, getting them trading, getting them there. Uh, Jerry Watts is his name, uh, Canine L-O-T. Um, so he and I have become sort of co-leads, at least getting us through the first part of the piece. Once the event happens itself, I, I'm the lead for the for the ham group, and we, we follow the uh, incident command structure, so I am actually the the top ham radio guy. Uh, and my job is really to monitor all the other stations. We have uh, eight net control people. Uh, we have loggers. Uh, we have people who are managing logistics traffic back to some people within the tent. We have people who are working with the medical corps so we can communicate with the superior ambulance company right there. So if we need an ambulance, we talk right to the medical guys and we can get an ambulance deployed uh, right away. Um, we also have about 20 people um, who are deployed in what they call the pre-finish area. Uh, that's a whole other separate unit that's set up at the, the last mile of the course. And they're set up strategically with a, with a medical team and a ham radio person. So if there's an incident, they can pretty readily get to them and, and take care of that. And we have about 10 or 12 other folks that work within the finish area. It's called Grant Park, where the, where the race ends. And they work with roving teams looking for folks that might need assistance of one kind or another, medical assistance. And if it gets escalated, they need to get it to uh, a, an ambulance or a, a, you know someone a care team. Um, the hams then communicate back to forward command, say you know we need X Y Z services here. So it's it's a um, it's a multifaceted uh, uh, attack. As I said, we have the the medical side, which collects all the data for people who need care, and then there's the data stream, information about what the race, uh, how it's going, where are the uh, where's the the bell-shaped curve, you know, like where are the most people and, and that sort of thing. Some of that data, we, we pass some of that traffic back. We, we do polling every half hour at each station and, and get a sense of how well the doctor's handling the traffic and then get a sense of uh, how many patients they've handled. And so that data gets fed into a big data program that Northwestern University has uh, developed to provide a visual description of, um, of what the, 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 the sense of what the race is doing, how it looks out there. Uh -huh. So it's situational awareness. So, so you talked about, you know, multiple nets, you have eight net control operators. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, how many, you know, different frequencies you're on, how many different nets are you running, you know, tactical and, and, and those things. So, you know, from the beginning, uh, when we were asked to do this, uh, and it was interesting because when, when we started doing it, we had no idea that we could even pull this off. Uh, they gave us the assignment in, August and the race was in October and we had to find a way to come up with about 80 people. Um, that's what we thought we needed. So that first year we got 60 people and it was a struggle. Uh, the other part of that was to find repeaters that we could count on that we thought would be useful for this event. Uh, so we spent a lot of time tracking down what repeaters were available and then once we had an idea of what we had, uh, that's when we broke this thing down and, and decided how the, uh, how the course would be, uh, would be covered. Um, basically, we have uh, uh, two main repeaters, and all of them can be used, by the way, for medical traffic. But we have two main repeaters that are focused primarily on course-wide medical traffic. So if there's a, an event somewhere along the course anywhere, we can talk to those folks. The logistics side of the house is broken up into two units, a store on the north side and a south side. And it just, it's, uh, that's a lot of traffic. Those, those net control guys are pretty busy managing that. In fact, the first year we did it, they wanted us to track the number of guys who dropped off the course and had to be picked up. And the, they had no idea how many people they were talking about. Turns out it was close to a thousand people that we had to track. Um, we really burned out a bunch of net control people uh, trying to track that information and burned out everybody. It was just an overwhelming amount of information for a, for a voice network to handle. Um, we don't do digi uh, any kind of digital traffic. There's some events like uh, the, the Mar Marine Corps that have a D-Star network that they use. We, we haven't done that. We've stuck primarily with voice. Um, mm -hmm. That's challenging enough, to be honest with you. We've, uh, we've tried some, um, you know, some Wi-Fi connections to some of our remote stations, but it hasn't been terribly successful. Um, so it's mostly a voice network. Uh, the, the, so the, 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 core nets, which also have backups for each one of those, um, cover the course. And then we've got some repeaters that were Grant Park and for that pre-finish area, because it turns out it's kind of a black hole from where we are. So it's, um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we don't think about often 
is that the radio coverage is one part of the problem, but a much bigger problem is the noise that comes with it. So, uh, for instance, I was monitoring the, the guys that were at the pre-finish area last year, and when they would key up, it was so loud, it sounded like a war zone. I mean, it was yeah. very, very difficult to hear what they were trying to say because they had to talk above the loud noise, and, and that pushed their mics to, to limits that was just basically hash, you know. So right. It was a struggle. Yeah, I bet it's hard. You know, I, I think about so. I work a couple of um, different races out here in Southern California. One's um, Baker Vegas. That's a the largest um, law enforcement race, and they run about 120 miles through the desert. It's a relay race, and usually there's about 300 teams. And you know, we get 300 runners in and 300 runners out, and they pass the baton. And we track all the times in and out. But that's 300 people. You know, you're talking about 45,000. Uh, there's another race we work, which is an ultra marathon, the AC 100, Angeles Crest 100. Again, there's about 300 runners. Now these guys, an individual runner in about 24 hour period will run a hundred miles and we track them in and, and out of the, of our checkpoint. Um, I can't imagine into the tens of thousands of people, how, or what kind of traffic you'd have. Um, and, and how you'd even begin to, you know, log it all and track it all and report it all over time. You know, we've got some great software for the AC 100. There's a local ham here who developed, um, some packet software that, you know, tracks a runner in, tracks a runner out. And I can tell where they are along the course because at every stage we have someone track, but, um, gosh, you're on a whole scale of, of big, um, and I can't even imagine what I'd do. You know, we, we, uh. We showed them what APRS could do for them, uh -huh. and and they kind of just laughed at it. I mean, we did it, and and we showed them how they could track their trucks and cars, and they were, where the front car is, where the trail car is. And the next year, they went and bought a commercial service that did the whole thing with just a little cell phone tab that went in there. So, you know, these, these guys have the resources to really do anything they want. They don't need us to do that. Um, mm. But what we provide is a sort of a skill set level that, that you can't really quantify. Uh, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about people who uh, make an avocation to, to communicate in a yep. professional manner, um, that's a skill set that they're lacking. In fact, one of our biggest challenges, the number of people, they, they hand out, I think, about a thousand radios. And most of those radios are pretty hard to work because you can't, it, there's, there's no discipline to it. Yep. Uh, people are talking over each other. They're, they're saying words that don't make any sense. I mean, what do you mean by runner down, for instance? Uh, mm -hmm. Does that mean you need medical care or does that mean the runner just fell down? I mean, you know, so there's there's a lot of that kind of stuff that makes it more challenging, which is where I think they've enjoyed sort of the kind of the discipline we brought. Not that we're experts. Believe me, we still have a lot of challenges ourselves. But, um, you know, we, we're, we're a little better than the, the, the average dog, I guess you'd say. So, I, Well, I can only imagine if they handed out a thousand radios, how many frequencies that would cover and, and <laughs> the chaos that would ensue. Yeah. Just based on all of that. So I think there are 40 radios right in Grant Park, all on the same channel mm -hmm. and, and all doing the same basic information like runner down well like who where are you and who are you yeah, where are you and and what happened to them and what kind of support do you need and and yeah, yeah. so it gets yeah. crazy pretty fast with renter is it yeah. right i mean they do have bib numbers but that you know that all becomes part of the challenge of trying to coordinate all that stuff and, you know and the, and the race as i said before these are extremely organized k they're extremely organized chaotic events i mean they're like planned disasters um, so they have a lot of contingency planning, but still things come up that you don't know they're going to happen. I mean, like, look at Boston, for instance. They went to school themselves on how to redefine their their network after that horrific mess. Um, right. We've done a lot of tabletops with the police uh, on how to manage that event here. Uh, it's just not something you ever want to do, uh, obviously. But, I mean, it's always in the back of our mind to be prepared for some kind of contingency that you can't expect. We had... Well yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting path on this. Uh, when, you know, when that happened in Boston, how much did it change, you know, the next year, or how much in your know, extra preparation did you have to do? How much did you sit down with, you know, law enforcement or the race officials to say, you know, what do we do if? Yeah, for us, it was it was uh, boning up a lot of the procedures that we had uh, in place, but then to really practice them more. So, like, we really started doing drills with the uh, aid station team to, to work as a team so we could figure out what's 
who is who, you know, who's got what assignment if something happens. We have to stop the race. Who's in charge at that rest station to or medical station to, to make that call? And then what role do the hams do? So, I mean, uh, for us, a lot of it was switching our roles over from being a medical communicator to being a support player for then the aid station captain who was then in charge of that area. So then we would have to change our, our roles a little bit. So a lot of it was just uh, practicing uh, uh, tabletop exercises, working through scenarios, uh, what happens if a fire happens on course and we've got to divert the course? You know, who does that? Who moves the stanchion? Um, there are a lot of those kind of uh, uh, drills. And there, there are a lot of others that the marathon itself does as contingency plannings with the city of Chicago. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm proudest of is that we have been, um, uh, we've been um, tagged. I don't know. What do you call it? Uh, we've had people from FEMA who've actually come and sat side by side with us to uh, see how we do what we do, uh, to see how well the city uh, works as an interoperability uh, a drill. And um, so, so, and these guys, uh, we had six guys one year who just sat and watched the ham radio teams work. Uh, they, they had observers in other places as well, but uh, basically it was, uh, you know, they were just watching how well we did. And, and we, got, we got pretty good marks on both scores, in fact. So uh, that was kind of heartening to know. Wait, go, uh, go back, go back one, Gary. So that's a great, so that's, that's one of your <laughs> operators. Is that, is that like a, a bus stop or? Uh, that happens to be, uh, no, it's just a little sign in that part of town, uh, where uh -huh. people can, uh, you know, put up posters and banners. Yeah. For a couple of years, they, uh, they put up these signs uh, cause they didn't know what ham, the, the race people didn't know what to call a ham radio guy. So uh -huh. we had people coming up and said, where can I get a ham? You know? <laughs> right. So, uh, <laughs> But, They're uh, hungry. They want a snack. Th this is a, a peculiar station because it's impossible to park there. So we only get about three guys uh, that work that station. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of them's not even a ham. But this is pretty typical. And we have two guys that sit out here and uh, they communicate back to forward command. And then the other guy, those would be examples in this picture, people mm -hmm. who would be communicating back to forward command. And then they would use a simplex frequency to the hams that are within the station, embedded someplace within the station, to, to communicate back whatever the doctor needed or whatever uh, whatever we were trying to tell them to do, you know. Um, so that that's pretty much how the network works. Uh, that's my little ham shack. Um, that doesn't look like a little ham shack. Well, it's got a lot of my old fun radio. That's, like, that's a little ham shack. <laughs> oh, that's a little ham shack. Yeah, this is a fun, fun ham shack. I have a couple. I've... When I got back into the hobby, my wife, before I got back in the hobby, my wife threw my, threw my helicrafters receiver away, which was my pet radio when I was a kid. And so I found it at Dayton about two years ago for about 100 bucks. So, you know, what, what, what you do when you get to a certain age is you go back and you collect your old radios and, uh -huh. and uh, just put them on the rack. You don't, I don't even use it. <laughs> They're my just all radio. sitting there. There, they're sitting there. I use mostly an ICOM radio. It's, in, it's inspiration. There, there looks like there's a lot of different radios there. Yeah, one, um, one side of the house is uh, HF. The other side of the house is uh, all kinds of different digital modes and UHF, VHF, that kind of thing. That's all so behind you, me in this picture. So you, you see, so but you do do some digital modes at home. Yeah. Uh -huh. But in the race, it's almost all UHF, VHF voice. You know, the, the, the problem is you need that immediacy of getting that information right away. And, and not that the digital traffic couldn't handle it. We just haven't found the right product to deliver. So even like our reporting, which is, you know, a digital traffic, you know, we only want to know a score of are you busy from one to five and are, how many people have you handled? So that reporting structure is really two numbers, you know, like a five and 20, let's say. Um, we write that down, put it into a database and, and we get that in managed pretty well. Can we routinize that? Can we make that automated? Sure. But, you know, this is a race that happens once a year. Right. So, you know, it's like who wants to go to <laughs> all that work, you know, for that? Yeah, and one of the thing, one of the things we find is it, it's difficult to get enough people to step up to do anything more than you know, say I have voice communication, you know, FM voice communication capabilities. You know, I, I we've been pushing, you know, FL Digi or Winlink or or you know any of the other one of the di digital you know D Star or DMR or System Fusion, and you know, getting everybody to to be on one platform, it's almost impossible. Well, and you, you don't have the saturation with a lot of those digital modes. You know, mm -hmm. who, who's going to have that radio? We started looking at some other some other backup plans to use. Uh, you know, in Chicago and Illinois, we have a, a network called Starcom, which is a government agency Motorola product that basically is a, 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 a commercial network that's used by the public service agencies. 
Mm -hmm. And we were thinking as an Oxcom event, we might be able to use that and, and deploy a few of those in the field in the case of, you know, something major happening, mm -hmm. um, major happening like, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, you use your imagination, you know. Right. Um, but uh, to date, we haven't really been able to really, and, and I'm sort of glad we haven't had to go that far, but we haven't really practiced Plan X, you know. I mean, uh, if if something all heck goes on and, and, and then the whole race has to be terminated and there's a big event going on. At that point, the city takes over, the police take over. We're, we're just sort of uh, annoyances, I suppose, to them. There's no real plan for us to be in that part. Yeah, well, and let's talk a little bit about that. You know, my experience when we do a lot of the public service events, there are a lot of, you know, agencies there, uh, law enforcement, fire, you know, ambulance services, and, and so on and so forth. And, and some play better than others, right? How does that work there at the marathon with you guys? Are, are you guys in your own little bubble and, and you might be standing next to law enforcement or fire or ambulance or the doctors, but is there, is there communication, cross communication, or is everybody just kind of in their own little bubble waiting for something bigger to happen? And then you'll figure out how to talk to one another. <laughs> You know, one of the things that was great about this study with uh, the FEMA group was was it really did it demonstrated how connected we all are as a team uh, mm -hmm. in that forward command tent. Uh, we are all respected uh, uh, cohorts and mm -hmm. there's no sense of us against them or, you know, we're better than you are. There, there, there's a real team effort that's um, that's exhibited in that room. Mm -hmm. And it and I think it shows. I mean, it shows in the final product that, that you know, we sort of put out. Um, since Boston, the number of folks in that back room that are with more alphabet soups uh, is much higher. They've had to expand the tent by uh, 10, uh, 20 feet to accommodate more of the uh, other agencies, Secret Service, FBI, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a much more complicated scenario to run these events. And that, so that's more, but that, I'll, I'll assume that's more at the Incident Command Center. Um, how about out in the field? Has had the population of the, you know, the TLAs grown out, you know, uh, along the race course? Are, are there more law enforcement, FBI, all those people, you know, spread out? Or are they mostly in the command center there with you? No, no, they're all spread out. In fact, a lot of them are playing close, folks. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't even know. We, we had a funny situation yesterday. I was, heard a story about a guy who went and took his uh, ham exam. Uh, he went from technician uh, general to extra in the, in the same class. And then they started chatting with a guy later. Turns out he was a, a, a plain clothes um, um, uh, undercover cop uh, mm -hmm. working the Chicago Marathon and wanted to get his ham radio license. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so I mean, there, there's a lot of those folks out there. I mean, I, I can't tell you the numbers, but a lot of them that, that are deployed throughout the course and uh, in plain clothes situations. So you would never know that they're there or not there. They, they just appear when they need to be there, you know. When, when you need to work with them. Right. Well, and, you know, you know, we don't even know who they are at the time. So, you know, we know the guys that have identified themselves, like the police officer who's wearing, a, you know. Yeah, uh, they're, in, they're in uniform. You know that they're there. Right. But the other folks are undercover. We don't know who they are. And if we need that resource, then that's where you call it in. And then they would deploy out to wherever those guys are. You know, if, that's, if, if they know where their assets are, we don't. Right. Uh, somebody would I, call on, on one of those hundreds of commercial radios that are out there and hopefully somebody would be listening. I was walking to the, my assignment about three in the morning and uh, all these FBI cars were going by to Soldier Field to get their assignment for the day. And I think there had to be 25 of those cars that went zipping by. So, you know, there, there are a lot of them out there, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, unfortunately, that's the kind of time we live in. We live in these times where you need to provide security uh, for these folks everywhere. I mean, everywhere. There were a couple of people who were like copycat play players at the Chicago Marathon right after the Boston Marathon. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's the world we so, live in. So uh, I'll guess based on, you know, having more than 100 operators at, at the, the race, it's more than just one um, one radio group. Is it a, is a number of different organizations? You know, it's like areas involved in your local, um, you know, in our area, we call it disaster communication support. Uh, that we work with the sheriff's department or the you know the group that works with the fire department. How many different groups come together? The amateur radio groups come together to work on this race. So we have we have hams from four states that come here. 
and, and some of them have been coming over over time. They, they just mm -hmm. like coming here. There's a good place to vacation, and, and so they come. Uh, but we have, I think, we have 12 different radio groups that have been identified that now provide their own team. So that's really great. Some as far as Peoria. Now, Peoria has had a team, an Aries team, that's been coming since the beginning. And Peoria is about a three and a half, four hour drive. So they come up here on their own, stay at a hotel and then work the event. Uh, we've got people who come in from Madison, Wisconsin, the same way. It's another uh, sort of a, a, a disciplined group. Um, but most of our guys are just Aries folks or, or you know, basically people who are ham, ham radio operators that don't come with any sort of uh, public service uh, um, uh, training. Uh, mm -hmm. Although I have to say I'm surprised when we did a survey, I think we had almost 60 percent have taken uh, most of the ICS 100, you know, those the preliminary courses, yeah. 100, 200, 100, 200, 800. 700, 800. Yeah. So I would hearten, hearten by that because I think that's that's important to know how that works in an event like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I still think there's a huge call for us as the leaders of this event to provide training uh, to our to our operators. We still get too many guys who show up with the radio, don't know how to use it, um, you know, or, or don't even know what they're doing when they do show up. So it's like, what's my assignment? You know, those those guys aren't the leads for each aid station. You know, you're going to expect to have a few of those guys. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, we, we're we still working that issue quite a bit. But uh, for the most so, part, we have so we have good representation. So, so Rob, I'll, I'll assume like a week or two after the race is over, you start planning for next year. Oh my God. The, the, sorry. The next day, the next day uh, uh -huh. I put a, we send a survey out the next day and start getting feedback. And then within a week we've collected that data to share with the, the race officials so that we can compare our notes. Uh -huh. And then about a, a literally, I think about a month later, we sit down with them and have a face to face to kind of do a hot wash and talk about what things went right, what went wrong, what do we have to fix for next year? Um, every year is always something a little different. A lot of it's, you know, medical logistic issues, you know, like we were short of this or short of that, uh, or we had communication issues at certain places that we have to, have to work on. PA system was too loud. So we had to, you know, couldn't, nobody could hear each other talk, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we'll have another meeting in about a month, I guess, um, to sit down and start planning the, the next event. Uh, and those go on, not a lot, a lot of meetings, but, you know, four or five a year that, uh, that we do with the whole team, with our we are a little subgroup within the whole. Um, there's uh, a core. There's like a core leadership team, right? Well, our our group is just the medical team, so okay. that's all. That's all we work with. I mean, there are other people that do finish line and start line and coursework, and you know that those are folks that we're not even involved with. I mean, we're only working with the medical teams, and of that, there's 30 people on this leadership team. So these are doctors, nurses, massage therapists, psychologists. Uh, the ambulance company is there. Uh, Northwestern's there with their data, their data folks that provide uh, that kind of support. Because um, out of this race, not only is this used as a you know an event, they also use it for research. So some of the studies they've done have been really seminal pieces that have set the standard for what other races have done. Um, after, for instance, the marathon that had that big meltdown. One of the things that they came up with was to have a, a flag announcing enunciator system that basically told people what the conditions were on the course. And it's the ham's responsibility to deploy those things. So um, they, they have different levels of, uh, you know, uh, black would be, of course, the, the race is over. It stopped. Right. But there would be a yellow flag that says, you know, it's caution. It's hot. And, you know, you might want to think about drinking more water or cutting your way short. Uh, green, of course, means go. Uh, by the way, I, I didn't mention, I think this is important, too, because one of the things that frustrates the heck out of me is that the only groups they, they respected the most early on were the two ham radio guys who do weather. So they provide uh, customized weather reports for the event. And they're, they, of course, do this uh, for their races work up at the, one of the counties up here. Um, but they bring those skills down to the event and can provide them really uh, pinpoint weather because if the course is, you know, over the whole city, it's... I don't know, maybe 35, 40 miles across, um, that uh, it changes. You know, it'd be, you'd be having snow at the north end and sun and shine at the south side, you know. So they, we, the hams provide the, the pinpoint weather for this thing. That, uh, but they're two licensed meteorologists who provide that. It just happen to be ham radio guys. And, and who are they giving that to? They're giving it to the incident command commander right so that the, they can uh, the pass it out across the course? We feed all this information to a big database that sits on the screen so they can all see that data, but it's to the top doctor. The doctor is the one who wants to know. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it's it's incredible when you follow the temperature uh, at certain points, when it hits a certain dew point, 
you start seeing a lot of incidents. It's, 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 we've watched it enough now that you can predict that when it gets to a certain degree, you can going to start seeing people piling up in those tents and incidents starting to happen, things that are going to be interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating. We, you know, we have a similar experience for the, the Baker to Vegas race. You know, I've, I've been doing it this little, this year coming up in March will be my, uh, mm-hmm. sixth or seventh year. And, um, when I first started doing it, it was in May and, you know, even as the sun started to go down, it would be over a hundred degrees and we would have, you know, ambulance after ambulance, taking people away, taking them to the hospital, you know, one direction or another. And, uh, three, four years ago, they said, well, you know, maybe we'll like do it a little earlier in the year. We'll do it in like beginning of April or end of March. And, and I'll tell you last year or the year before, maybe one or two ambulances at the most, because it's a lot cooler. And even, you know, even at the height of the day, it may hit 80 degrees. It's just a, a much more pleasant, you know, weather conditions to run. And, you know, we've had some threats of rain or, or um, thunder and lightning, and we watch for those things. But, um, but I can imagine how weather would be a big factor, especially if they're doing that, that long of a run. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's really amazing to see the, you know, the synchrony of, of the temperature, humidity index and the, uh, and basically what that means to the runners and the amount of care that they need to pr- or provide. And when you're talking about, well, one of the things that, again, I think the, the race is proudest of is, is providing that sort of support mm-hmm. to these kind of fee- people. Uh, even though they got 45,000 runners, I think there's something like 15,000 of them have never run a marathon before. So wow. to be committed to the, that number of folks and give them the, the, the care and support that, that would encourage them to try to do a marathon mm-hmm. is a pretty remarkable thing. So, you know, 35,000 are probably have run them before and are pretty expert at it, know how to manage them, their, them themselves, but the 15,000 who haven't, um, you know, you see all kinds of interesting stories that come out of that, you know. You know, on the hot days, people, they, they a lot of those folks will stop the race at the nine-mile nine, nine mark or something like that and, and right. try to get off, you know. Is is the race that they run there, is it um, one where, you, you know, you could do a, a full or a half or, or different parts, or is it just no. basically one big one big? 36 miler or whatever it happens to be. It is interesting that at, at the about the uh, the 10th or the 11th aid station, there seems to be a pretty big drop off. So there, depending on the weather, there can be a lot of people piled up there who just drop out of the course and can't do it. Um, most this is not a multi-state level race. It's a it's a marathon, 26 miles. Got so it. that that's that's the goal, and uh, if you can't make it, well, that's all right. There's no shame in that, but right, you know. The, but you're not the, finishing. You're not finishing, so yeah, yeah. And, and you have to get all the way back to Grant Park to finish. So, <laughs> and and is it is it um you know I, I, we see with the like the AC 100 that's ultra marathon, and I, we're at about mile 74, 76. Um, it's kind of a mix of the runner says I can't go anymore, and the doctor says you can't go anymore. How does that how does that work where where you guys are where throughout the race? It, it, do the medical teams you know tag a bunch of folks to say, uh, yeah, sorry, um, you know you you gave your shot and you made it here and and thanks for playing. <laughs> you know, uh, two years ago we started adding a psychologist to the uh, to the course to the the menu. You know, we weren't sure where to put them initially. Uh, we we've been better to, now we are better able to identify where the places are where they should be. Uh, but this year in particular, there were three places, three incidents where the medical doctor strongly encouraged that runner to stop running and and the runner wouldn't stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this is where we were able to help forward that information to the next station so that they could capture that person. And eventually they did convince that person to stop running because it was injurious to them. I mean, it was going to kill them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, it's a peculiar thing. The, the folks that run the marathons, God love them, um, they're pretty determined folks. I mean, they've been training for six months and yeah. by God, they're going to do it, you know? Uh, so there's a kind of a psycholo- psychological set that comes with that, that you want to honor and respect. I mean, understand that they're trying to set a, you know, they're trying to achieve something them- themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, we're, you know, we're there to really protect their, their, uh, <laughs> their yeah, you want to, you want to keep them safe. <laughs> right. So, you know, yes, yeah. but it's, it is a peculiar part, I think, uh, to the, the sort of folks that come to a marathon, you know, um, but our job really is just to help to communicate to the next station what, uh, you know, what what's coming. Maybe there's somebody you should keep an eye out for mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. That's why we have uh, in the later stations, we often have more hams because then you can have 
uh, folks that are deployed within the aid station and can keep an eye on some of the folks that look like they need more support. Maybe they they didn't want to stop at that aid station, but they sure need help. Or maybe they collapse yeah. somewhere down a little bit. Um, and and plus, uh, when you start at uh, four in the morning, by the time the race catches up with you at two in the afternoon, uh, a lot of your guys are pretty tired. So it's good to have sort of uh, people who relief operators can come in and you know help you out that way. The thing that's interesting is that every one of these events that you do or I do. They all have a peculiar sort of character, and, and it's really a matter of, of, of building your team and to, to provide the support that the organizers need for it. And, and it's, it, that's the key, I think, is to find a way to serve you know, whoever it is we're working. And, and I think if we do it that way, if we think about it that way, uh, Ham Radio has a future for this kind of stuff. One of the sure. things that happened with Boston, and I don't know the full story because uh, I haven't been able to follow up with it, but after Boston, there was a move to get rid of all the hams. And Boston was identified by the hams. Hams basically defined that event. And it turns out that Boston had a lot of unique problems uh, that we don't have in Chicago. Lots of municipalities, lots of beefdoms, lots of different ambulance companies, you know, nine different folks that things had to get through and no, no chain of command, no way to talk from the front of the course to the back of the course. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they did it, they worked it over the years the way they did it was fine. But, you know, they made some structural changes in Boston to accommodate that that kind of problem. But that's that's my point is that every race is unique. It's got its own character. Uh, the Marine Corps Marathon puts a ham radio guy with each one of the corpsmen, the medic guys, and they're a team. They, they're tagged together and they work together, and they're, you know, throughout their little three or four hundred yards or a mile or whatever they do. They just they pace back and forth. So, I mean, every every event's different. Every event's got its own character. And as yeah. ham radio folks, our job is to kind of figure out what's the best way we can support them and um, and do a job well. Yeah, it, that is one of those unique things. I, I, I think of the experiences that I've had over the years in the different races. And, you know, some of them we know. Uh, Baker to Vegas, you know, they run six miles. And, and where we are, they're running six miles, like, uphill. And there And there is literally no downhill or no flat they start and they run and it's straight you can actually with binoculars you can see the six mile course and you know we track them from the time they left the station before us to the time that they get to our mile out to the time they get to our station and you know we we run a log on them and we look to see okay you know the average time in the beginning of the race is a lot shorter than the average time at the end of the race and every once you know while you get an outlier you know oh this person is 20 minutes off the pace, 30 minutes off the pace. When they hit an hour off the pace, you know, we tell the mile out people, keep an eye on them. And then as they come through, you know, we go to the medics to say, hey, by the way, this one's coming in, this bib number. They are, you know, so far off the norm, um, they're going to need attention. You know, and, and um, you know, that's a race where they, they do six miles. On the other side, you know, you look at something like Angeles Crest 100, by the time they get to us, they've run 70 miles or 70 plus miles, and they're going to do 100. Um, and it's the same thing if if they've been out between stations. It's about again six six or seven miles per station. If they've been out longer than the norm, um, you know, we you know we tell the docs, and they actually they they bring them in and they weigh them and they take a comparison from the stage before. And if they lose, you know, X percent of body weight, they they just they ding them. They're out. Um, for the same reason, they want them to be able to survive this thing. This is not something where they want anybody to, you know, run themselves in the ground. And I, you know, I can't imagine at the number of runners that you have, how you even manage that they came through your station, let alone what kind of physical shape they're in. Yeah. Well, it takes a lot of people to observe that. And of course the, the, the presumption is that someone's going to self-observe their condition and stop and get help. Yeah. So how do you how do you do the, your event? Do do you do it with uh, simplex uh, between the stations or? Um, you know, so it, so it all depends. So um, uh, AC one hundred, it's all packet. We do packet network, um, and we do talk simplex between stations. But not every station can talk to each other because you know it's a hundred. It's literally a hundred miles through you know mountainous areas, um, and there are some net control stations, and we do relaying. But mostly we rely on this packet system that was in. Uh, um, created by one of the hams that works with the program and you know we just look at the reports you know the report said this person went in here and they went out there and here's where they're on pace and and we will call back to the previous stations but they they log all the information about the runner so that they can pull it up and see where they are 
for um, for Baker to Vegas, uh, it, it's kind of two regional areas. You know, there's there's a point on one side where the first, um, I don't know, 15 stations can talk to each other. And then there's a set on the other side of the hill where the other 10 or so can talk to each other. And, you know, we just relay the information back and forth. And, you know, again, we look at the logs and, and at my station alone, we have about 20 hams and most of the stations have somewhere between, you know, eight and 20 people to, you know, log this and log that and, you know, make sure that um, there's a runner coming in and there, there's somebody there to meet them to take the baton to move out. Um, and, and again, everybody's looking at all the numbers all the time and, you know, we're there because we want to help and we care. And so you look at, you know, this person starting to fall behind. Um, some of the software we use for the AC 100, it actually tells you, Hey, they're off the pace and now they're really off the pace. And now maybe they're missing. And, and we've had to do things about that over time. You know, if, if you do six miles and you're in two and a half or three hours, we, we actually had somebody uh, last year that stopped on a bench somewhere and fell asleep. <laughs> and and we told the runners leaving our station, hey, um, as you're going through, there's two spots where we know where people sit and rest. If you get to that spot and there's somebody sleeping there, wake them up and let them know, hey, you fell asleep. And if they need the help, let us know. And, you know, they can come back to us or they can go on forward. And somebody did find them and they were sleeping on the bench and they had a cramp and, and they did literally, you know, they bailed out of the race and they came back towards us. So we, we do other events, too. I mean, the marathon is, is our premier event around here. But, you know, a lot of us do bike events. That's sort of similar to what you're talking about. There's a 100-mile bike event. And, yep. and and for that, we use a lot more packet. And we use we uh, a software program called Tickets CAD, which is a dispatch program, mm-hmm. um, uh, open source, so that we can uh, track our resources and be able to, to deploy them where we need to have them uh, over the course of that 100-mile uh, range. Um, but it's the same thing where you're trying to, you know, encourage people to get off the course. Or if you haven't gotten to this point at some point, it really, you have to get off. Yep. And in that case, it's got, they, they have multiple little loops. So if you, if you can't do the hundred, you can do the 60 or the 50 or the 25 right. And, right. and find your way off. But it, you know, the thing that the bottom line with all these things is that these are real world events that we can deploy ham radio, uh, to, to, to get experience, to get practice, uh, to, to really improve our skills all of it doesn't matter even what the event is. The point is that these are these are ways that we can actually do something that helps the community. And and you know if you wait around for the earthquake in Los Angeles or whatever, uh, or maybe when here in Chicago, I don't know. Uh, by that time, we won't be organized enough to to be able to be of much help. Yeah, but, and you know. and that's kind of why we do it. I know I know Gary does um, Gary does the MS bike rides, and it's the same thing. You know they they rely on a lot of UHF VHF. I think they do a lot of um, APRS to see you know, you're here or they're there or, you know, something happens and it's along this point and you can pull up a map to say, okay, this is the closest person to that and, and, and respond or, you know, go out and, and help with that. And, and like you said, part of the reason why we do the races is because if we're just sitting and waiting for that disaster to happen, <laughs> we're not going to be ready. And, and, you know, I've been in a number of these that, you know, we have volunteers show up and and they're not ready. They're not, like you said, they don't know how to use their radio or it's not programmed or both or worse, you know, that they don't come with all the things that they need to be able to be self-sufficient for whatever period of time that is. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud that our own club is, is a pretty good field day um, record where we've been building over a number of years to get really better at it. And people keep asking me why, why I don't like contesting. I don't want to work field day because it's, it's not what I want to do. Turns out that it's a great training ground for, mm-hmm. you know, these events, uh, but both of them are really, you know, you got to pass traffic, you got to handle traffic, you got to be able to hear call signs and send them back out again. Yeah. Uh, even though it sounds like a ridiculous, stupid contest drill, I mean, it actually has practical implications when you put it into a real world problem. And uh, and being able to communicate that information effectively is, is the key thing. So I keep saying, you know, it builds our skill sets, even though it may not be something that you enjoy doing necessarily as a contest itself. Its end is to make you a better operator, make you a better uh, ham radio, uh, you know, person. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I will I will tell you my first, you know, I think I got my ticket in um, uh, January of 2011 and my first field day was that June and and that's really what hooked me you know I, I showed up there and having gone to one or two Aries meetings 
Um, you know, and I showed up um, for a couple hours and, and I stayed, you know, for the duration. And I, it was it was so much fun. And there were so many, you know, parts of, you know, we're out here and we have no resources or a very limited amount of resources. And what can we do and how can we make it work? And, you know, the teamwork and the camaraderie, and it was just it was just fun. And I think that was the first year. And then all of the years since then, I'm at least on site for 24 hours. And, and some of them, you know, you get a day before. If, if you, um, you know, you set up appropriately and you can't start early and a lot of them, I've been on, you know, station for 36, 40, 40 plus hours. Um, some of it's, you know, security work cause we're setting all this stuff up and, you know, leaving it out in the public somewhere. Um, but I think that's a really, it's a really great event for planning for these things. So when I, when I first started out doing these things, I, I went around town trying to find some place that we could be co-joined, you know, some community mm-hmm. that we could provide our services to and everyone in our town and, and, you know, the North suburbs of Chicago, these guys all have very powerful independent networks. They don't need ham radio volunteers for anything. So it was like, you know, go away, little boy. We don't, we don't want your services here. Now that's a totally different story when you get into the smaller towns where everybody knows everybody and, you know, they don't have as many resources. Um, So these events have sort of helped us, uh, you know, fill a, fill a demand, I guess, for, for being able to, to keep our skills and practice up a little bit. I was, um, I, I spent about 10 years volunteering for the Red Cross and, and kind of like you were saying, um, the, the best thing about that was was to see how quickly the hams could adapt to those different problems and circumstances and provide services. Not, most of the time it wasn't radio services, it was other things, mm-hmm. but, but the hams were more willing and flexible uh, to provide whatever needed to be done and it was a great training ground for for uh, you know whatever we're going to be doing, I guess you know. But um, you know, I've I've always had an attraction to the public service side of uh, ham radio. I always thought that's what that's one of the things that's one of the things that defines who we are. It's one of the things we provide you know the service and is that quid pro quo for all the great things uh, that they give us. So I, I just feel it's an obligation for us to be part of uh, our communities to to provide some sort of service. Don't always get the same sort of um, you know welcome wagon from the from the towns, but uh, <laughs> we're we're working it. Yeah, and you know, and and I, I on the other side, I'm in, you know Los Angeles. It's you know a huge huge area, and you know you, you know we show up and we help, and there are some organizations that understand our role, and there's other organizations they don't they don't get why we're there, or what we're doing, and you know you have. Um, lots of good operators, and you have the ones that show up to you know announce that they're here to save the day. And, <laughs> you kind of have to push those folks aside and, and you know, buttonhole them into some smaller um, role that they don't do t- too much damage. Hi, Gary. Oh, hey, I, I, I wanted to ask uh, how you, uh, Rob, how you bring in a new ham who has not done this before. What, what kind of process do you have to get them uh, up to speed? So, so one of the first things we do when people sign up, there's a, a, a sheet that they fill out that gives us information about their background, what training they've had, maybe even what kind of equipment they might have. Uh, and then when they get assigned, they get assigned to an aid station. So they have experienced people around them that, uh, that can guide them. And then the lead for each aid station is responsible for really taking that person, putting them under his wings, making sure their radio is programmed, making sure they know how to use it, and then giving them assignment that's going to make them succeed. So that they're going to want to come back. Um, we, we've had some crash and burn incidents where we put people in the wrong seat. Um, I'll be the first to admit that. I mean, too many of us say we can be net controls. And then when you put him in the net control spot, you find out uh, maybe this wasn't ready for him. Um, so that the net control job is probably the toughest job to fill because it's a skill set that is pretty unique and, and takes some time to learn how to, uh, how to do um, again, this is where contesting and all that stuff comes in. Now, I had a young man with us this year who was in the forward command tent. Um, he didn't do net control, but he did logging. And boy, what did he he learn from that experience is invaluable. I mean, he 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 learned so much about how to how the traffic is handled and how it's used, so that he could easily fit into a net control situation next year, uh, even though he doesn't have a lot of experience at it. So that the the point is to give people uh, scaffolds, uh, give them places where they can step in and and get some practice and experience, uh, and then move up, you know, up to that level. And and so we try to keep our leads from year to year. I mean, I've, we've been blessed because I think about eighty percent of the leads come back every year. And then if they don't, we bring somebody who's been at that station to take it over. Um, 
The other thing we try to do, and I want to do more of, is is uh, video training. You know, provide them some sort of uh, overview of of what they're going to run into. It's kind of hard to duplicate this experience on a on a video, but we can certainly have uh, experts talk about best experiences that that they've encountered. You know, what they ran into. Um, the hardest thing is trying to get the doctors to understand what role we play and how we can help them. And so that that's been a battle we were we went working on. And when when you when you interact with the doctors, what what's the part that they don't understand that you can do a lot more than you can, or or, or a lot less than they want you to? No, it's usually the more thing. A lot of them think we know more than we do, uh, because uh-huh. many of them come from an OR, you know, an emergency room situation, and uh, they're in the field now, and they're not used to ha- they're used to having an entire hospital behind them, right? So they have uh, incredible demands that uh, they're expecting us to fill. And so that that becomes kind of a challenging thing, I think, a little bit. But uh, basically, it's a it, there's a real respect that they have for us because they we provide stuff that they have no interest in and can't do. So um, uh, you know, like I said, they tend to often turn to us and say, "Well, where should I put this or where should I do that?" Because we've been there at the beginning and we're there to the end, and we sort of have, offer some kind of continuity, I guess, over time. Because um, a lot of these guys, well. Don't, they're not always the same doctors from year to year. It's usually, you know, different folks uh, or, or different teams, different nursing teams and that sort of thing. So it's they have a much bigger challenge than we do in a lot of ways because they, they bring people from all over the place that, um, you know, 1,500 medical guys is a lot of folks. Yeah, and they may, they may or may not have experienced the, the what they're getting themselves into. This is such a unique medical emergency kind of problem. I mean, it yep. really is a unique skill set to, to mm-hmm. manage that and to know – when someone's pushed their limits, you know, and, yeah. and say, hey, you should really stop, you know, uh, it's it's a challenge. I mean, it's a sports event, you know, sports event. Nowadays, sports medicine is, you know, let's let's just push the limits and see how far you can go and we'll fix it later. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, these you know, you think about these marathon races, there are very few and far between sports events where you have more, you know, multiple 10,000 people showing up to do something all at the same time. Yeah, you know, you look at the surge, the surge, you know, of of what happens if it doesn't go right, even just for, you know, ten percent of them. So you know, you're you're talking about the participants, but yeah. you know, alongside them is about two million visitors, sure, or, you know, spectators. So along the course, people are tracking them as they go through. People uh-huh. will leapfrog and try to catch up with their runner and try to uh-huh. find them. So there's always packs of people through the whole course. Uh-huh. So th- there's a lot of folks that are involved with this race that are not just the runners. You know, it's it's a and and they're part of our part of our care, I guess. You know, part of what who is under our, our domain if we have to keep an eye out for those guys. And do they, do, they, do they get do that? You know, so if I think of, of the stuff that we do, mm, I don't think so much. You know, in the middle of the desert. Well, I guess if somebody really had a bad time that was a spectator, you know, friends or family of, of one of these law enforcement runners for the Baker to Vegas race, I'll, I'll assume that someone would care for them. But I think in, in general, we're really looking at the racers um, and I hadn't really given a whole lot of thought about what would happen if somebody else, you know, I, I've looked at our ham community, you know, and, um, you know, I got a little gray hair here and I'm probably younger than than the most of the operators that that we work with, although I'm bringing the curve down because over a number of year, I bring one or two of my children who are also hams as well to, to come work along there. But, you know, you know, what happens when you're in the middle of nowhere and literally, you know, an hour drive plus to, you know, even a little teeny tiny kind of hospital. Well, I, oops, there goes the bat phone here. Sorry. I don't know how to shut that off. It's usually, I get, uh, you know, a lot of these robo calls. They'll call yeah. Them. Yeah. We get out of its misery. And I could. <laughs> Maybe I'll just stop it. We could just we could interview them live on the TV, see what they're selling. Uh, see, I guess I didn't stop it there, and then I'll show you. It's all right. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. The way it that's goes. Right. Yeah, well, that, those those remote uh, events uh, that you have is is a, a completely different challenge. I mean, how to get people there safely and back. I mean, you know that 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 was the problem with uh, even like like the Boston thing when when dangerous things were going on, it became a crime scene. You know, how do you protect? That's it, one of the things I worry about the most is how do you protect our guys from whatever you know and and we lost uh, over the years we've lost some people because they don't want to be put in that kind of a potential dangerous situation you know sure sure uh, how how many hours of um of training or or um you know you know team kind of work do you think your operators get you know leading up to an event so, like this so these these uh 
you know, of the 12 clubs that I've talked about, I would say about about 80 percent of those are specialized in public service events. So my partner, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Watts, his entire team, their whole charter is just doing public service events. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, they get training almost, they're doing events almost every weekend. Um, my club, which provides, he provides about 25 or 30 people. We provide about 25 or 30 people. We don't do as many public service events because we're more of a general interest club. Mm -hmm. But some of the other clubs, uh, that that's all they do is drill and train and do that kind of stuff. So uh, probably not enough training. We, we should probably do more, I think. I mean, that's in general, uh, that, that's the case. Um, it's just hard to do. I, I support a couple of other marathons in town here, so I work as a kind of a, a doobie for those, so it's kind of fun to do a quid pro quo with, with other groups. Um, so, I mean, I think more and more people are, I try to encourage more and more people to do other events so they can see how other people do it, so you can get a better idea. How They're back. They're back, and I thought the battery would die. Oh yeah, <laughs> Illinois Perg, they want money too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, getting practice is is the toughest thing, and and training them. By the way, Gary, to your question earlier, we do provide a pretty thorough uh, uh, handbook for everybody to get. Uh, but I think you probably know nobody reads anymore. Um, they they just I can't seem to, and I we 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 labor hours on this book, and then people said. They ask questions. You say, "What's well, all in the handbook?" I said, "Well, I didn't read it." You know, so it's like uh, yeah. the challenge is how to train people. So um, our colleagues at uh, at um, one of the uh, universities does all the training for the medical teams in, in in some of these zones. They put together a pretty extensive uh, video training campaign. So they they actually train their guys on their job with whatever they had to do, just using cell phones basically to try to put together little training tapes. Um, Unfortunately, being in the video business, I, I tend to be, I, I don't particularly like doing just cell phone videos. So I, I like to do a little more robust thing. When when it's all over, you you said you guys get together for a hot wash some some time after. What's the makeup of the of the audience that participates in that hot wash? Is it just is it just ham radio operators, or are you doing it with the race officials and law enforcement and the doctors and and all those folks? So that, that happens in, in different layers as well. So the, the immediate hot wash is with the medical team, which we're part of. Uh, and, and the very first thing I do is I put a survey out to our 140 operators and ask them a, a set of things. The, the folks that pop up as trouble areas, like places where I need to kind of go back and find out what happened here, uh, I'll meet with those folks independently and we'll have a little powwow just to get the story straight. You know, why didn't the wheelchairs get there? What was the miscommunication? How come we didn't understand this or that? Um, then we'll carry it to the bigger group. Uh, and that group has representatives that then meet with police and fire and all that. We won't meet police and fire again until the beginnings and plannings for the next event. Now, the next event is the Shamrock Shuffle, which is a little baby event compared to this one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a short little uh, uh, 10, 8K that's the, in March or so. And so we, we support that as well. And it's just sort of a training ground for us to test out new ideas and, and do some things. Uh, but really, the big the big push is for the marathon, and that we have our first training event for that in in May, uh, and then we have another big training event with uh, with the police and everybody in uh, in September, and the events in October. So, uh -huh. so about a month out, you should tend to get them. You know, yeah. and when you do those training events, are those like you know tabletop exercises, or you actually go out in the field and you're you know like uh, running running the equipment live to just see how it all works? Uh, it's it's pretty much tabletop because it's it's pretty hard to deploy all that stuff out and yeah. and you know it's a lot of people a lot of manpower to tie up you know and sure it takes time so I, I, and I think that if you just get people even in a room if it's just a handheld just get people in a room to uh, practice talking this thing through it really is uh, slows the process down enough so that you can really analyze the, the major markers that you've got to hit. That's the key thing. When you're having a, an event that's uh, something unique that you don't know how to, you have a no precedent for, it's like, how do you break this thing down and start working the problem? And that's where the tabletops, I think, help you give you a process that you can start to use to say, here's a model. Here's where's where we should go. Is everybody safe? You know, let's get our guys together and do a, do a roll call and make sure everybody's together. Now let's let's build a plan. Who needs to be where? Blah blah blah. My face here indicates a question. Um, here is a question. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I can remember what it was, what kinds of things have you discovered that did require big changes, or even uh, you know, significant, maybe not big? 
uh, as a result of, well, for instance, the biggest change was, was uh, communication on course. Uh, from the very beginning, when they had to shut down the whole course, the problem was, how do you shut down a race that, that's embedded in the whole city? And so, uh, among, among other things they learned, both from the Boston and now more recently, is that they need to stop it at each aid station, so it's stop in place. And so you put people in place that will actually make the runners stop and not go forward. Because as you can imagine, if you stop aid station nine, you've got all these guys still coming up from behind that are going to crash into aid station nine. So there's that whole issue. And it's it's like who's in charge of the barricades, who's going to deploy the barricades, uh, you know, and if we have to divert, where are they going to get the barricades? So, you know, those kind of things uh, that go on um, that you have to think through a little bit. Uh, like, I think that... It's, the contingency planning is like really understanding who's in charge of the piece parts if we need to deploy something different. Um, so that's 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 probably the biggest thing that's happened. I think the other part is just communication in general. So they've improved their communication with the flags on course to tell people what the conditions are so they know that they're either getting into more serious conditions or, or less. The other thing is they put DJs at every aid station so they can make announcements to the runners to, to tell them that there's storms coming. So seek shelter for instance uh the other part was it was developing shelters so like building an entire plant so they had contingencies so if they had to put people someplace where would they go under bridges in buildings they had to find those locations and identify them and then know that they could get a hold of that the business the owner to get into those things you know we have on course for instance several places that are diversion points so you can get off and pour 25 or thirty thousand people into a park if we needed to so you could say everybody run up to aid station four and then park it there and then that park could accommodate all those people. That kind of stuff wasn't necessarily in the, the thinking at the beginning, uh, but a lot more has gone on with the contingency planning as a result of uh, the, event, the events and the incidents that we've seen. You know, e even, even just a course diversion, which you wouldn't think is a big deal, but one day at the Shamrock, there was an incident on one of the bridges in Chicago and we had to literally change the course on the fly within five minutes. And we did. I mean, people just made it happen. We, you know, Chicago is pretty simple because it's just square streets. So we just had to go one street over and come down. But that meant moving a lot of people and placards and all that kind of stuff. And cars, by the way. Uh, that was the fun part. City came in with tow trucks and just pulled people out. So there was a lot of surprise <laughs> drivers on that one. So, <laughs> do, do you find that... Um the, the multiple communications channels, everybody's trying to handle the traffic or does just the hams or just the commercial or just the police do what they need to do? No, everybody has their own discrete channel where they handle their particular piece of traffic. And there's, I had a colleague once who tried to monitor it all. And, and we have, by the way, ham radio folks that are embedded with the police and fire and the, and the command center over there. And some of them like to try to monitor the police radios and all that. It's really, you know, the, the old adage is you have, you know, uh, two ears and one mouth or whatever it is. But basically, you can't handle more than one piece of traffic at a time. And you can try. I mean, you can try to listen to six different conversations, but it becomes hash. So um, I, I've tried to be very discreet about everybody listens to whatever they're managing, even me. I don't try to listen to 16 different channels of information. I may just hover around and, and see how the operators are working. And if I have to needle drop into one conversation, I will. But uh, typically, I, I try to just sit back and, and kind of manage the event, I guess, or manage my part of the event. Uh, but, if, but no, if, there's no, yeah. If the, uh, if the decision gets made someplace that the race has got to stop for weather or some other major emergency, does that tend to filter out over every communications channel and, yes, you know, and it's right. chaos? Right. Yeah, it comes out to us. It goes uh, to us, to the DJ, uh, so the medical team knows. Then it goes to the, the course director has got a radio. The, 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 the aid station captain has a radio. Now, the problem is how he disseminates that within his own team is much more complicated. And that's where the hands can play a bigger role because they don't have 40 radios in an aid station. You know, they got one or two. So uh, that that becomes the, the challenge is how to disseminate. Now, the, the, the DJ can, through his loudspeaker, can, can you know, get out the, the message to somebody. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd assume that somebody's saying that the race is over. There's a whole bunch of runners that are just like, yeah, that's nice, but I'm still running. <laughs> 
can imagine that would be challenging. At that, best. That's exactly what happens. I mean, it's it, people don't believe it, and uh, they want to just get to the next station. You know, they figure, right. well, it's just going to continue. So explaining what you're up against and, and how to explain to those people why we're stopping the race is important, you know. Um, but communication is, is a, was one of the big barriers that they discovered is, had to be kind of overcome when they shut the race down in 2007. And so that's, that's the role that we've come to play, I think, uh, here that's different than, than some of the other marathons or other events that may have started with hams as a part of the planning team and then found themselves doing like course logistics and all kinds of things that really are not really our business, really, you know. And so, you know, we, we came, I think, at the right time when I think uh, our, our role could, as I said before, is, could be better defined. So we're supporting the right parts of the of the race. I mean, it is a basically a for profit event, you know, and that, these are not things necessarily ham radio is supposed to support. But if we're doing health and welfare, I think we're well, we're well uh, protected in that sense. But, you know, there's there've been a lot of other hams that were involved with other commercial events that that's uh, not necessarily legal. Not to put a damper on things here. <laughs> no, it's yeah. Yeah, I think around been, here uh, they, they they tend to try to stick with uh, the nonprofits, but you know, sometimes that's you know kind of yeah, yeah, I'm not sure exactly if you're a nonprofit or not. Um the well, other one question. of the best things about this is is that it's really built a strong relationship with us and the city. You know, our Aries groups here never had much of a chance to build a relationship with uh, uh, any of the municipal government here in in the, in the Cook County, and it's really given us a place at the table where they've you know we've earned our respect and and uh, or earned their respect, I should say. So it's uh, that's been a good positive thing that's come out of all this. So I can think of one more question, and then and David, I promise I'll go away again. No, do, do, right. do you get hams coming in that have participated, especially in leadership roles from other marathons, you know, Minneapolis or New York or Boston, and uh, how well do they integrate and how much do, do you have to tell them not to tell you what to do? <laughs> you know, what we get a lot more of are people that are representing other events that have come to observe this event, as I have done. I've gone to the, you know, Marine Corps Marathon in Minneapolis or whatever. Um, we get a few that have are working other events, not many. Uh, there aren't that many in the Midwest as big as the you know the Chicago Marathon. I mean, Minneapolis would be the next best thing, I suppose. Um, so we don't get much of that, but most of the folks who do come, who you know, there's a g- bunch of guys from Peoria, as I mentioned, they're very respectful and and just pretty much follow the the system that we put in place and provide feedback afterwards if they don't like it and then we reflect on it and sometimes we make changes so it's it's a it's a lead, it's a very collegial sort of group i think in the most for the most part i mean I, I don't see any difficulties with that but the one thing i will say is that um, as a community uh not every marathon is thrilled about having ham radio folks involved with them uh i've heard some really nasty stories about Hams that, as I said earlier, put up, you know, their their schedule demands and and say we have to have X Y Z circumstances, air conditioned trucks or whatever. Uh, that has killed uh, a lot of relationships. I mean, I remember when I first worked for the Red Cross, uh, they said we will never have a ham radio group come into this organization again. And I said, well, why? Because they they basically took all their equipment and left. They got upset and they just picked up and left. Now. We do ourselves are a disservice when we do that kind of stuff, and that's been that's been one of the barriers we've had to overcome over the years as a, as yeah. a community. Yeah, I, I I've experienced that where you know you have a great core team, and then you have a couple of people that show up that are you know unknown quantities and proceed to create challenges or opportunities, as we like to call them. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, the, the environment has changed quite a bit. And I think in the early days when ham radio was the only guy that could provide some of the services we provide, uh, you know, we could be a little bit more arrogant, I suppose. But we can't be anymore. I mean, frankly, yeah. they can they can replace us with a cell phone in a nanosecond. And they've tried <laughs> and yeah. they find that it gets jammed up and they can't mean, you know, they can't make it work. But that doesn't mean that we need to continue on with that kind of uh, with that kind of attitude. I think the, the entire community needs to learn that service means something. It means you know you basically work as a humble servant to the cause, and provide what resources you can to uh, to support it. Um, and and there's a chain of command that we need to respect. I mean that's part of it in every department. Um, that's not easy for a lot of hands to understand. They don't necessarily like being told where to go. <laughs> 
you know, I, I, I love the message and, you know, so Gary, you know, one of the messages we get is everything is VHF, UHF voice. And the other is we're just there to help. And as long as all the hams can remember, at least that you can do that, then, you know, we'll be a better service. One of my most favorite hams that I worked with over the years, unfortunately passed away maybe I think two years ago now. He was a former Chicago cop and he said, Rob, whatever you want me to do, I'm here for you. I'll just tell me what you want to do. I've spent my whole life being told by somebody, a superior, to go watch that door or go stand by that hydrant. And that was my job. And I, 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 I didn't believe him at first. I thought, come on, you're kidding me. I said, you know, I, I need a guy to stand out here to pass out radios at three in the morning. Okay, I'll do it. You know, that, that kind of attitude was, was, uh, goes a long way to not only uh, endear himself to, to me and, and all that, but basically to, to show that that's the spirit you need to have to, to really be successful as a team. You know, so anyway, I miss Jimmy. He was a great inspiration to us all. Yeah, and we need we need more people like that to step up and, and participate. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, at least tell our story. You know, it's 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 been a it's been a great journey. I can't believe it's been ten years that we've done this. Uh, I think it's been a great thing for the hand community. It's been a great thing for the community itself, and uh, we we don't try to by choice we don't try to you know advertise much about what we do um the bank prefers that it's not you know big big uh, we don't do big splashes and do lots of publicity and all that sort of thing we let them get all the the limelight you know now this is for the hams hams need to know the yeah ham, yeah the ham specific parts which yeah, is, it, which is it sort is of important a, a constant issue for me because hams who do what you do don't want to hog the limelight, but how, how do hams, other, other hams know how this happens if you don't get on a show like this and talk about it? So one of, one of the big challenges we have uh, that our whole community has is because they're public airwaves, we, we have had trouble with people who've been intruders who've come in and have disrupted the communications and have really made it awkward. So, you know, I said we have eight or nine repeaters so the reason we have so many is if we have to start moving around traffic we can do that yeah. um that gets awkward if they start tracking you and following you around <laughs> and uh it's it's a chore and and that's part of the the, the business i mean you know if, if you have an encrypted network you don't have that problem but we don't you have sort of a public network anybody can listen to which is you know which presents its own problems i guess you know yeah. Uh, and we do. We are always looking at uh, new technology. We're always looking at different ways to do things. I, I, I'm a resistant to change entirely because the to get people up to the curve from year to year to try something new is like scary. <laughs> you, yeah. got, you got people promoting you to do DMR or D-Star or things like that. And yeah. say, not yeah. everybody's got those radios. Most people don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and asking people to go out and, and invest in a technology is it's not our experience has been, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah. And we get a lot of guys who do Monday morning quarterbacking saying, Oh, we don't like the way your whole network is set up. You know, you should do it all offline and have bring people in. And, and I mean, offline meaning you should have people to report to offline sites and then they report back to forward command. And I said, well, that just slows the whole process down. So you yeah. end up getting more traffic convoluted through different channels, you know, it's right. So anyway, it's, it's been fun thinking about this as a problem, but, Unfortunately, I think that the solution that we stumbled onto early on continues to be pretty robust. It works pretty well, so long as we have repeaters. You know, I mean, it. it this all hangs on the good graces of uh, eight repeater clubs that are willing to support us and support their machines. You, you can give them a plug if you want. You know, which ones yeah. they are. Yeah. Well, uh, Sarah North Shore Radio Club. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, SRO uh, machine, the uh, Chicago FM Club, um, Park which is a, a part of the North, uh, NBC network. They have a repeater up on West Tower. Uh, and then we have a couple of other private ones that we just deploy ourselves. And you're using a mix of VHF and UHF? Yeah, we use VHF for medical and UHF for logistics. And the reason for that is that we don't have people then banging into each other at an aid station. Because <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I got to tell you, well, with eight, eight stations at forward command, getting them so they don't, desense each other has been a real technical challenge 
I mean, you don't think about that, but it's like having field day with UHF radios. I mean, yeah, it's, right. it was a nightmare. Yeah. Now, <laughs> and other, you don't do any... Oh, go ahead, Gary. Are there hams doing other jobs in addition to medical? Because you, you've been talking about medical, but did, are there other ham groups that are doing this too? Or is, is that other... No. No, that's all we do is the medical support, okay. you know, logistics for the medical team. Our, our main role is, is focused on the medical community um, because really that's, that's really, I think, what hams are chartered to do. I think if we start moving into some of the other things where how we help, help them do the race and providing our, so our free services for that, well, that's really against the spirit of the FCC rules. Yeah, if, they're, if, they're, if it's a commercial race, yeah. You can't be yeah. in, in their it's logistics. They're paying people to do that job, and you know, here I'm going to take a paid job away from a guy now. Yeah. So we we provide a service that that I think really is the right place to be. I mean, all the doctors are volunteers. You know, there, there's no one getting money out of that. So, all right, David, I, I wanted to give a plug here to our competition. It's Thursday okay. night, and uh, these guys are are about to go live. Let's see if he's making any noise yet. I've got to push the play button, I guess. Yeah, Neil's got to be live right now. Or just starting at least. To be. This episode of Ham Talk Live is comes. brought to you by Tower Electronics. Oh, we get his commercial. Perfect. Cables and yeah, more. Okay. Call nine two zero. Okay, so we're not we're not hogging the whole audience because there's like four people watching the uh, the feed right now. And uh, oh, we went up to two. I see. Yeah, and, and 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 of those it, it, it of those varies. four, I'm one, and uh, you yeah, may you guys I'm, may be I'm the other three. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Well, it's I a get Thursday I, I, night. I appreciate your, uh, you know, at least highlighting this event. It's it's something that I've I've spent way too many hours working on, and so is so, some of my colleagues. You know, it's become a, a little avocation. I I think the we spend about a hundred, hundred hours or so a year working on this. I mean, it's not something that's uh, just you walk out of bed and it happens. You know, yeah, there's well, a lot yeah. of work. I, I do wish you were a little more conversant with what goes on because you know all the, you know, hemming and hawing you've been doing trying to figure things out. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, Gary. Uh, yeah, just me. No, it's been it's been a great journey, and uh, you know I have met so many great uh, hams that I didn't know from my own club, but other people come from other clubs. And the best thing that's happened over the last uh, two or three years is that the Aries community is really coming around now to kind of embrace it more, and I I think that's been good. I I always felt this should have been an Aries event anyway, um, but we're starting to get more Aries support. I think so. That's that's pretty good. And there's a new leadership in our state for that here, so that's that's helped. Yeah, but, that's one of the things we talked about, David. Should Aries run public service events or just highly support them? Yeah, and, and you know, our our Aries group, mostly we support them. I'm not sure that, you know, we want to run, you know, in the Angeles Crest 100, that's run by an organization. The Baker to Vegas race, that's run by an organization. You know, we support the LA Marathon. Some of the operators do. I, I don't because I usually have a conflict that weekend. And that, you know, that's run primarily by the city here and there's some organization. I don't know if I want to run it, but definitely we want to be there to support it. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think they, they bring a certain discipline to the whole party that's been sort of fun. I mean, and certainly they do more drills than most most hams do. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's the thing that, that I think. I mean, we just can't find ways to do enough training. And that it, it's hard to get people together to do that. Well, and that's been our experience, too, is it's, you know, we can provide the training, but getting people to, like, show up and participate, you know. Um, or read the it, book. That's the, that's the hard part. Yeah, read the book or be prepared, you know. We do two or three big you know, drills every year and, you know, in, in conjunction with, you know, Aries in Los Angeles supports the hospital system. So last month was the big hospital drill. They do statewide hospital disaster drill. And there's a couple other, um, shakeout and, and getting enough people to show up for those is, is sometimes difficult. And, you know, a lot of it is because state, state run drills, they do them on a Thursday, you know, and, and, you know, I have a job and I work and I take those days off, but not, not all the hams are willing to do that. And there are a large number of them that are retired and they can come, but, but, but not the whole group. Yeah. Yeah. And people people say, um, uh, I've heard a fair number of complaints that field day should be more emergency communications oriented. And I say that would be fine if you don't want anybody to be there. <laughs> right. I mean, there, there's that activity takes place in the fall. It's called the simulated emergency test. You know, field day yeah, gets so, thirty or forty thousand hams, and the SETs right. get thirty or forty hundred. Right. And when we have a hard time pulling off a set because of because of that, you know, like when do you do it, and what are you doing, and who's going to participate, and getting all the other organizations on board, 
and you know field day is just fun we just we have fun we barbecue and we play radio in a parking lot somewhere and and you know it's as much of contest that i do every year and i get really competitive you should hear me yell and scream when i get another state that we haven't gotten yeah, ours are unfortunately became too competitive. It's a pendulum, <laughs> and so we're trying to bring it. We're trying to bring it back and get the social side out. So we, we've got a whole team this year that's going to just focus on social stuff, yeah. and we'll see if that'll help <laughs> yeah. calm the waters a little bit. But uh, yeah, we get pretty rabid. You know, you get caught up in the fever of it all. So it's well, and and you know, some of the years we've had we've had challenges or we've had other events that have conflicted, and and I haven't had you know our groups location to go to and i'll go see a couple of other sites and and the, you know it does vary from laid back party atmosphere to ultra competitive you know and in the laid back party atmosphere they're like oh if you want to run a radio go ahead and find a radio and operate it and the other ones are like oh we don't know who you are and we're in it for the points <laughs> and you can just stand there and watch but don't touch anything who, who knows no. it they could be missing something because one other thing yes. i wanted to bring up and because we talked a fair amount about the uh, boston marathon and the year that they had the bombing, I did two shows uh, talking to the guys that ran the Boston Marathon. And it was way back in the early days of Ham Radio Now, episode 74 and 75. So um, if you're interested in hearing those guys talk about it while well, it was fresh, you know, just weeks later, uh, go back in history. You'll have to pick it up on YouTube. It's not on the website. And, uh, you know, youtube.com slash Ham Radio Now or just you know, Ham Radio Now. Uh, Boston Marathon, and you'll uh, and you'll find them. So uh, some pretty interesting, and two to, uh, two totally different um, sets of interviews with different people doing different jobs. And David is pointing to uh, Arvin back there. Yeah, so we haven't done it. To... You know what I commercial? No. So go ahead so if, and do if, the commercial. If you David. if you you know if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, you know, please, you know, visit hamradionow.tv and look for Arvin and click the pig and support us. Send money. Send money. Click the pig. I like that. Yeah, click the pig. I got my Arvin here. I know Gary has his Arvin there. Let me mention uh, the Patreon thing. I don't know if you've been following that. Um a little bit. About half of our contributions come through Patreon and they had a uh, little dust up. Um, they changed the method of billing, or at least they thought they were going to change the method of billing. They never actually did it. Um, it would, there's about a, there's a 35 cent and 2.9% fee involved in every Patreon transaction. Um, and they were going to shit. And I've been paying that, that it had been, it had come out of the money that was pledged to all the, mm -hmm. the people that use Patreon. Uh, and they were going to shift that burden to the, the Patreon, which, which meant if you were pledging a dollar a month, suddenly you were pledging a dollar about 38. If you were pledging $5 a month, you were pledging, now you were paying about five fifty. Um, it, they've, they discovered, and they got just a, a firestorm of feedback. Um, you think? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because it, it where it hit from that example, it hit the the one and two dollar contributors harder. Right. You know? Yeah. And if you think, well, yeah, okay, you're giving a buck a month, suddenly it's a dollar thirty eight. Who cares? At thirty eight cents. But a lot of folks support five, ten, fifteen different shows or other things on Patreon, and if they're doing that, then suddenly that's a few bucks a month, and that becomes more significant. So it was also the principle of the thing. They, they, you know, they didn't consult anybody. They just announced they were going to do it. Well, they changed their mind. So that didn't happen. We lost six, six of our 60 or so, uh, patrons at that point. <clears throat> Every given month we, we lose and gain a couple anyway, but you know, six all at once. They didn't send me a note and said, it's because Patreon is being bad, but that did happen. Other folks were complaining about having some pretty big losses too. So they say they have to do something because they're, they need to adjust their economic model a little bit to just stay in business. So right. We'll and I know some of the other, the other, um, the other shows I know, like, um, you know, Martin and Sterling said that they changed theirs to just by episode cause they weren't coming out as consistently yeah. as opposed to, you know, per month. And so everybody's model is slightly different. Right. They, Patreon gives you the option to mm -hmm. have your contributors contribute. The contributor doesn't get 
the option. It's the it's the show creator. It's the show you get to say, yeah. yeah. Of course. And it seemed of to course. me like the, the consistency for the uh, when we do enough shows in a month that if someone's going to give us a couple of bucks a month, they're going to get shows. And yeah. if a month goes by where they don't, well, the month before and the month after they got plenty. So, yeah. The, the, no well, hopefully, we're keeping up. And, no and I and I've been working really hard here to get the studio up yeah. on the west coast and. Coming soon. Yeah. And if people complain that they haven't seen a show, it's not, we gave you money and we haven't seen a show. It's, we want to see a show. Right. So, right. I hope that's the case. It, it, that's, that's the feedback I've been getting. All right. Yeah. I guess we got to wrap this up so that we can then go on to the best part of the show. Yeah. So the, um, I want to thank you, Rob, uh, for joining us and, and sharing all the great information about the marathon that you're working on. And um, hopefully... Uh, There'll be some great stories in the future to come. Maybe we'll have you back on. And uh, thank you. I'm impressed. I wish this was going on when I lived back there. Well, you can come. <laughs> I, as I said, I've got guys from uh, four different states. Yeah, it'd be but, a long yeah. drive, but it might, you know, someday. I know the territory. At least I used to. <laughs> okay, David, uh, here's your thank title. You Tell people who you are. So uh, I'm David Goldenberg, W0DHG. And I am Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Make all the titles go away. You know, I'll bet he can figure out the last word if we give him the first two. We, I don't sure. know if you've ever made it to the end of a ham radio now show. We don't require that. Yeah, it's not so important. But We sign gonna, off the same gonna, way every time. And we're going to set you up for it, okay? And, okay? and I'll start, Gary, all right? Uh, all yours. Uh, this is ham radio now. Thank you so much. Over. And. Oh, out. Perfect. Excellent. See? <laughs> Anyone can do it. I get it. <laughs> I'm still trying to sell myself on the most important part. You, That's not the end of the show. And we, we always end that way, but That's we That's the end really of the show, but way. it's not the end of the show. We're still recording because now will be the best part of the show. Yeah. I've heard a lot about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in the video production business, I don't know if you do, uh, you know, talk shows or anything like that. Um, no. But in- Open mics. Everything, everything that I've ever worked on that was involved in conversations, interviews, things like that. As soon as you shut things down, then people really the loosen up, up and they start to talk. Sometimes the they mess up. Yeah, you know, uh, if it's politicians, you got to yeah, you, know, you want to make sure the mic's turned up loud. But <laughs> but you know, usually it's just okay. You let your hair down a little bit and uh, and then have a more uh, casual conversation. So we discovered that. We, we're not fooling anybody. We don't turn Facebook off and the hard drive is still running, but now yep. we just, you know, we don't feel like we're obligated to talk about the subject. We just go on. And we're hoping we're not like holding anything back during the main, main course. No. Yeah. So, um, I lived in Chicago from 62 to 1986 and worked at video production companies and you're in the video production business and there's a pretty good chance I was an editor for projects that you brought to the first company I worked at at Editel. At Editel, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I sort of remember your name from that place. You know, I, I did work there. Yeah. Do you uh, remember, I did what, bring projects at Editel. Remember what years that, that might have been? Oh, boy. It had to be uh, in the 80s. You know, and I don't remember the exact one. I'd have to go back yeah. and look. By the 80s, I, 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 w I was gone from Editel. Um Okay. My time yeah, I, there was 73 through 79. Okay. Most of my work was film work. And so, uh, you know, I would yeah. finish film, that kind of thing. I didn't transition to uh, to tape, et cetera, until about the 80s, you know, mid 80s. Yep. Yeah. Well, they, so in the 90s. all those places did a lot of film. Um, they didn't shoot. They were post-production. They weren't production companies. I worked at yeah. Optimus as well, and you might have been there. Optimus, and, sure. And oh, yeah. I, was, I was there from like 83 till 86. So were they, they weren't in uh, what I call the Jack Barron building at that time. It was on Grand Avenue there. Yeah. Did they move? They, well, they, that's where they are now, or that's where they moved to. Right. Yeah, for a while, they were on Orleans, I think. They were up that way for a while. Yeah, I, they were on, on Grand Avenue when I was there. Yeah, but, okay. But they, so they didn't shoot um, any film, but, they, but I would say 90% of the projects originated on film and not on video. Right. And so we went from an old TK-45 film chain when I started um, with Editel to the Bosch and the, you know, the very fancy negative transfer machines right. that didn't scratch your film. And, 
Yeah. You know, I was I was trying to recount. I think I, in my career, and I'm sure you're the same way. I think I've worked with about 60 different formats over the years. You know, and, and they're still making them up because now they're they're crazy because they're all digital. You can find all kinds of codecs that are in different formats, but it's insane how the business has changed all all those years. Yeah, uh, it's also insane that I can sit here in my uh, bonus room with a the six camera studio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and afford to do that on my own. Yeah. Well, oh, by the way, I'd like to point out that the ARL still hasn't. So don't know what's keeping them from <laughs> doing stuff like this. It should have been a QS, a QST, QST TV show for, I don't know, the last at least five years. But certainly, but yeah, certainly don't. doing live blogging for God's sake. That that's uh, easy yeah. enough to do these days, you know? Yeah. Well, they're, yeah. they're doing a couple audio podcasts now, but seeing it, Dipping a toe into it. Maybe they'll finally get to it. So you're going to try to trick me into saying something you can use on Twitter and then, uh, nope. then I'll get arrested? And, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what this is about. We're not that There's clever. no trick. There's no tricking. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've, we've, uh, we, we've been pushing a little harder on our, our ADLRL reps here to, uh, to try to defend a bit more of what, what we can do together better as a club. I mean, we have a club of 200 members. But, you know, we're feeling disconnected from them as a group, and it would be nice to be able to, to feel like they understand that we exist and we, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, ah, I'm trying to, I'm tired now, but it's a relationship and it's not just a top down kind of thing that, that we can help each other. So uh, we've been trying to figure out how to communicate that with them more. Back in the uh, in the 70s, when I was involved with the Chicago FM Club, I, I have been saying for a long time, that there was little to no ARL connection because we were FM and ARL was not FM at that time. Um, and then uh, I, I came across, um, well, I was pointed to a note by uh, a fellow uh, a CFMC leader from that era, a Rich. Uh, he was WA9LRI back then, and now he's in five land. And I don't remember what his call sign is. Sorry, Rich, if you're watching. Um, he said that the Chicago FM club was looking for old, uh, squelch tail issues. And I was the editor oh. for a while and I have a big stack of them. So I started scanning them and, and, you know, sending them over to those guys so they'd have some of their history back. And, uh, I came across not a lot of articles, but a few talking about CFMC participating in a simulated emergency test in like 1974, 75. So I was not remembering some of the connections that they did have with the ARL, but it wasn't so they were, close. They, they were a huge club at one point. I mean, when I got involved, I think they had 350 members or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was president in the late 70s and I remember 400 members. Oh my, really? I had no yeah. idea it was that big. Well, not a lot with the FM, now, but. FM was booming. I don't, they're not that big now. They're in the 250, 300 category. Yeah. Well, that's still pretty good. More competition. You know, lots more radio clubs. Right. Right. Yeah. Now they've, I remember the squelch tail, uh, issues too. I remember reading those. I mean, cause when you first got into the hobby, well, when I did anyway, uh, you got an automatic membership in the CFMC, at least that's what I remember. <laughs> So I was, I was a little token member for a while. Back, know, I got squelch tail and all that. Back when I was doing it, you had to get voted in and there were like first reading of your application and then second <laughs> reading of your application and Come on, really? you know, background checks, probably not background checks. Um, and by the way, squelch tail is spelled T A L E, not right. T A I L. So right. clever. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't invent that. That came before me. So is it online now? Do they have a different, like a digital oh, version of it? Do PDF, they yeah. But they still do it, though. Yeah, still the squelch tail, still uh, out as a PDF. Huh. And uh, for those of you Chicago FM Club members, pretty soon, well, you can see 73 and 74. Maybe I got to 75. And I got a few more years to scan in. It takes a long time. So. Uh, well, that's great. I mean, it's good to have that history. I've got a bunch of guys who don't want to preserve our history and I, I put it away in a storage locker but someday somebody will wake up and say yeah i wish we had those documents or that stuff i think it'd be good we used to publish a transmitter we called it the transmitter and it was a paper publication for years but uh we've long gone now it's it's there's no remnants of it anymore yeah somebody didn't save them 
You know, I just happened to save them and drag them from place to place as I was moving around the country. Back in that time, um, CFAR F or SRO and, and Chicago FM Club were sort of like the competition. Um, so I think uh, I think SRO was the first ham club in Chicago. Am I right about that? Do you, I don't do know, you know if it was the first ham club. It was the first repeater. Oh, okay. Um, there, there was might have been a uh, a club that preceded them or three. I mean, I, I became a ham in '65, and of course, ham radio had been in Chicago since the beginning. You know, they're hams yeah. right. in Chicago in the in the teens and twenties, and the, I, they must have formed radio clubs. But you know, where SRO got started, I don't know. C CFMC got started in the mid '60s. Yeah, we we're we we're a Johnny come lately. We 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 were, came in the '70s, I think. So the North Shore. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was around, um, I mean, I, li I grew up in Winnetka, and that, and I oh, yeah. would commute from Winnetka down to, uh, and we met for a while down to uh, downtown where I was working. And uh, the North Shore Repeater 14709 came on the air sometime in that era. And I could, uh, I remember, because they had an auto patch, and most of the other big clubs oh, did yeah. not have one yet. So right. it kind of attracted a lot of members. I remember... And in the early days, uh, there was Skywarn back then, and I'm not sure how I got hooked up with it, but I was um, became aware. I could, maybe somebody gave me a phone call at work, and I wasn't real busy doing anything. So, uh, you know, there was a, a severe thunderstorm or tornado outbreak that was coming in towards Chicago, and uh, so I went out to my car and ran net control from my car. And to reach the weather service, I had to call them on the phone using the auto patch of the North Shore Radio Club's repeater. <laughs> And that was from down on Lincoln Avenue near downtown. So that was pretty good coverage. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. David's going, I have, I've got three hours of sleep. <laughs> no, nah, it's okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I, you know, I wonder, so how, in the Chicago area, how busy are the repeaters? You know, there's some, uh, during drive time that are pretty busy. You know, the problem, I'll tell you one of the things that's happened is that with all the proliferation of all these digital modes, we've completely yeah bifurcated our market so we've got guys who are fusion guys dmr guys okay. p25 guys uhf vhf are usually the guys who are kind of the annoying folk uh you know whatever so <laughs> no i mean i'm talking about you know whatever no you it's get okay. on the radio and say, what did you eat today well i it, ate this well you know. that's right or you know my my uh bursitis is you know acting up or whatever right i went to see and and i guess that's just you know it's the same theory you know, I, I'm a I'm a baby ham. You know, I think in some ways I've only been <laughs> licensed since like 2011, and uh, you know the analog repeaters were busier then, and you know we had we you know I'm part of the Papa system is kind of the preeminent D Star network, and you know in the U S. You know there's like 17 or 18 linked repeaters from San Diego all the way up to Santa Barbara and beyond now, and I think as far as Las Vegas, and. Uh, there was some traffic there, but the analog was always hot and busy and heavy. And and nowadays, there's very little analog traffic anymore. Everybody's on D Star, and now they have DMR as well. And and there's the Brand Meister, so you could talk from you know DMR to D Star and and all those other things. And and I wonder, as we talk to people across the country, what does it look like? What does it sound like where you are? And it and it sounds like it's the same. Same thing. And, you know, if, uh, Fusion has opened up all kinds of, you know, in our gateway, we get guys from Scotland and Ireland coming in all the time. It's it's really amazing in a way. Uh, there's a pretty open channel to, to England every morning. I can hear these guys talking about stuff from England. But uh, I, I still like uh, the old fashioned HF and talking to people that way. So doing cool. DX. But, cool. HF, but it's all so. changed. <laughs> HF, yeah. When. Um Back in the uh, in the seventies, for a time, the seven six Chicago FM Club repeater had an average daily uptime of uh, approaching twenty hours. Wow! Yeah. No, when I got back when I got back into the hobby, I remember our repeater being very busy all the time, and we used to have one guy who was through the night. I mean, you could you could call in at three in the morning, and he would be there. He'd be yeah. the guardian of the repeater, and yeah. would would carry you home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there would, there would be people talking up until 1, 2 in the morning, and then they'd start up again at 5. Yeah. Um, and I've been back to Chicago uh, sporadically um, over the past 10 years or so, mostly the Tapper conferences, and uh, scanning all of 2 meters and all of 440. And uh, you would think in a metro area like that, you should not be able to find a time when there's no repeaters on the air. But there, there were 
you know, oh, during yeah. the day. And in the evening rush hours, then activity would pick up, but it was never as, uh, uh, as busy. And that's the same complaint everywhere. So we used to have some really great conversation yep. on ours. We had some guys that were really brainiacs, and, and you, we, you'd get into some really good technical discussions or philosophical discussions. A lot of that's kind of gone away. I, I think, you know, those guys have passed on, and, and, you know, now it's more journeyman sort of stuff. Not not terribly interesting conversations. I think that's part of the attractor was having those guys on. You'd, you'd want to hear what they were had to say, you know. Yeah. They, they've, they've kind of compartmentalized. Well, I don't know if they've compartmentalized it, but they've kind of focused it in our area. Where there's, you know, there's the little drive time traffic here and there, but we have some some round tables or, you know, open open discussion nets several, three, maybe four nights a week. And and those are really good. And sometimes I just listen or sometimes I'll participate, you know, technical or this or that or the other thing. And even just round tables where somebody, you know, picks the topic of the week to just talk about and you throw it around. And so that you- brings out more folks. Do you have one one club repeater that you focus on mostly, or you you know it sounds like you uh, mostly? Um, you know, so so fans. you know, Papa. I'm a member of that Papa system, so you know, uh, one of my two radios in my in my car when I'm driving is pretty much always listening to that one, and there's the other one I flip around. Uh, you know, there's a couple of other repeater systems. Um, there's a there's a single kind of standalone that covers a, a lot of the valley where I live and a lot of the Aries operators in my district you know, listen to that. And then there's, um, another, uh, repeater system called the uh, darn, the disaster area repeater network. And, um, and there's that's more, what we use. There's more people watching us on movies. Facebook now than there were during the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that, that one draws a lot of attention too. So, um, it, it occurs to me to ask, um, what about the fires? It's still going on, yeah. right? Big deal. Uh, you know, um, they will say the fires are still going. Uh, I actually, uh, what was it? Monday night, I had to go to the Boy Scout office for uh, for a meeting, and uh, I met a guy there. I didn't know before, but I met him um, first introduction, and he was participating in the same program as I was. And he's a firefighter in the in the Bel Air area near the Getty Fire. And you know, it's it's uh, I think now it's like sixty or seventy percent contained. But you know, the way fires go. You know, they knock it down and they have a perimeter around it. And you, you can't say it's 100% contained until you clear a line. You know, he said, I think it's 300 feet all the way around it and stomp everything that could possibly catch on fire um, wow. so that it can't spread beyond that. Because what happens is, you know, it burns all the stuff above ground and then it burns underground, you know, the root systems and whatever. And and so in a lot of the areas, you don't see smoke coming up from from the area, but stuff is still burning underground and you've got to kind of put it out and, and have a perimeter around it so that if the winds blow or something else comes up, it can't hop outside of that and, and move forward. Mostly in Los Angeles right now, in Los Angeles County, I think it's all down and controlled and, and good perimeters and, and you don't really smell any smoke. In, in Ventura County, the fire, um, Thomas fire, I think, uh, that thing's still going and, you know, burned from, kind of the LA County line all the way up uh, through Ventura County and I think into Santa Barbara and, and that thing's still going. Um, but, you know, it's, the weather's calmed down a little bit. It's not quite as windy out there anymore. Uh, it was cool for a couple of days and then got hot and then now it's kind of just moderate. Is there well, any? The video, the video was insane. Seeing yeah. some of those pictures. Yeah, just yeah. insane. Is there ham radio involved? Um. I, I know in in uh, Ventura County at that at that fire there there were some deployments, um, and and they were involved down here in Los Angeles, um, I think in the Santa Clarita area the the groups that work with the fire department got a little bit involved and and in one of the areas the sheriff's department team got a little involved. Uh, we did not Aries did not um, activate or deploy none of the hospitals that we work with. Um, we're affected, and that's primarily what drives our our deployment. Uh, we are starting to work a little bit more with the highway patrol, um, but but they they didn't need any of our services. So um, I I got to get all my stuff out of the car because you know I put put our you know our basic uniform and some of the extra supplies that I keep around in, in my truck just in case we needed it and and hasn't hasn't happened. So I heard they use a lot of HF for for fire 
you know, communications. Uh, you know, the different groups do different things. Actually, the the Highway Patrol is still using HF in their in their vehicles because they've been using it for years. And and there was a um, uh, a state bill that they put in to convert with everybody else. You know, everybody's converting to digital and trunking and eight hundred or nine hundred. And and when we put it to the voters, I think eight eight years ago or ten years ago, they didn't vote to spend the money. And and actually, it's been a boon to the Highway Patrol because they're still using um, HF analog stuff, and it just works for them. You know, it gets good coverage, and you, you see the Highway Patrol cars, you know, driving around. There are state police, and they still have, you know, the the long, you know, metal whips on the car. You know, the ten foot whips on the car. Now, when you say um, HF, are you talking about like three it's megahertz like, or? It's it's no, it's like um, I used to know what it was. It's I mean, like a lot of highway patrols use six, low low band thirty megahertz band. to fifty megahertz. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. It's like it's like six meters. It's like six like fifty okay. megahertz. So that's that is technically VHF, which starts at thirty megahertz. So. Yeah, I, and I think I think it's slightly above that. I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe maybe higher than that. Yeah. Either they were using mostly you know uh, uh, forty meters with um, uh, what do you call it uh, Nevis Nevis antennas and that kind of thing for because of the valleys and all that they couldn't yeah. get UHF or VHF to work. Well, and then I think that's why they initially did that, so that they had the better coverage. And then they said, oh, well, you know, we're going to do this big investment and, you know, millions or billions of dollars to put lots of repeaters and new, you know, new radios in all the cars and this and that. And it just didn't go anywhere. And so uh, lucky for them, they still have all that equipment. And, and when <laughs> there are big issues like this and, and things go down, they're one of the one organizations that is still very self-reliant. They can talk to each other without too many problems. Now, when they had the fires up in Northern California, it was widespread enough that um, that they did have some challenges from, um, you know, area to area and then talking with some of the other folks. So I know the hams were very involved up in Northern California when they had all the problems up in Santa Clara. We still haven't done our show with those guys. Yeah, you know, I tried to find some of them, but they, you know, in the woodwork. <laughs> it was hard. Like I was saying. Is, is it hard I to did find... Hear- Find people to talk to. I mean, you you have a difficult time getting subjects. Uh, most of the time, no. But but sometimes, you know, what a lot of times what will happen is, you know, we'll see a little puff piece here or a, or a serious ham radio news story there. And if you don't get a name of an operator, it's hard to track down the ham yeah. radio group that did this thing. You know, if they put one call sign in there. Boom, I can just go to QRZ and I got their email address. You know, 90% of the time you send them an email and most of the time they'll respond back and you can get them on the air just like I got you. Um, But if they said, you know, ham radio, you know, helped, you know, with, you know, evacuating this and doing that and the other thing. And if they don't tell you somebody's name or somebody's call sign, um, you know, you can try and, you know, I've, I've tried to, you know, get to a reporter, you know, you wrote the story, who did you talk to? And sometimes you get information, but. Most of the time, it, it just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. You know who turned us on to you, don't you? Or do you? Yeah, no, one of the guys in our uh, my group here. Matt. Yeah, Brad, uh, K-9, Brad K-9WRZ. It's yeah. his fault that you're, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can thank him for these uh, two and a half hours that you've just lost with us. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad. Grateful. I sent him a note and said grateful for him to uh, recommend me. What the heck? Yeah, it's yeah. good. And it was, yeah. it's a great show. It was. Uh, yeah. You, you knew your stuff. Well, you know, I've been doing it for 10 years. I don't know something <laughs> by now. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's it's been a fun thing. And it's been a real uh, learning curve, you know, for me, too. I mean, it's, it's been a technical challenge and a, a human uh, resources challenge. But um, it, it's been fun. And it's fun getting you know, the big issue for me now is is how to transition the leadership of this to somebody so they can carry it on for a while. You know, I don't want to just get up and leave, you know, and not that I'm leaving anywhere, but you know, at some point you got to think about that. That is the thing in almost every category of, of enterprise, uh, hams and otherwise is, yeah. uh, you, you get too good at it and finding someone else who can maintain that level of uh, capability and is willing to, um, especially if it's you've been a major passion and you really put time into it. Can someone else do that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This is one of the things, you know, I, I like I said, I've been doing uh, Baker Vegas, I think six years, seven years coming up. 
And, you know, I, I, with, uh, you know, we have a, our, um, our district emergency coordinator has been our stage lead. And over the last three years, you know, myself and one of the other ECs, we kind of take over the stage per se. And, and now we're kind of standing back and, you know, you know, we're in charge, but, you know, we're putting more and more people on the radio and doing this and giving them jobs so that the same thing, you know, they can take over going forward. And, you know, we're not, we're not the ones that have all the tribal knowledge and, and know all the stuff. So my advice to people getting into leadership positions and doing things is uh, keep your, keep it down a little bit. You're going to get yourself <laughs> stuck. Yeah. You know, all this, you know, keep your ambitions in check. It's hard though, you know, when you're starting a thing like oh, this, this thing took a lot of energy to build it up and you know, you know where all the bodies are buried and it takes a kind of a personality to get it to that point. Yeah. It takes a different personality to carry it on. And, and it's probably, it's probably hard too. Cause once they, once they realize oh, Rob knows his stuff, <laughs> they're never going to ask Rob to go away and stop doing it. It's the same thing, you know, with us, they're never going to ask us not to come and support the race and come play along. Right. So I, I do fire ourselves every year. A guy's getting mad at me now, I think, cause I do that. But I said, seriously, if you don't want us, just say so. We'll, we'll go away. It's sort of a ploy to maybe get out from under this thing. But <laughs> How's that but, working you know, out? It hasn't worked at all. He just yeah. laughs at me. But I mean, I, I'm sort of partly serious because I don't want to overstay our, our, you know, our visit. If, we, if we're not providing a service to them, yeah. you know, they could they could buy another 10, 100, you know, 150 radios and do it some other way. But well, whatever. get another 150 volunteers who know what they're doing. Know right. how to don't, don't hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah, don't worry. I, I, I'm securing my volunteer job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you ha right. do you have a uh, someone you know in your in your shadow in your footsteps that? Uh, yeah, there there are a couple of people that are that are coming along. You know, do this, they know uh, it? Uh, probably not. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, they're not but, watching this show. But but there are people that that you know have been involved from the beginning that that are starting to step up more. So I'm, I'm having the same problem with my club. You know, I've been president for, for too dang long, too, I think. But, uh, you know, I've got to figure out how to just say goodbye, you know, and move on. Yep. And let them, somebody else do it. You know, I did this with my Boy Scout troop, by the way. I, I grew a yeah. Boy Scout troop from... I'm I'm right in the middle of that. I had 16 kids. I had 16 kids in my troop. I grew up to 120. Wow. And I left, and the place blew up. And so that lesson was big on me. They ended up building two troops out of it. But... Um, so, I mean, that's the problem with, with when you build these empires. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to be careful. You know, uh, yeah. Bill W9NHQ? Is that call uh, sign sounds familiar? He was no. a big mover and shaker in the, uh, it was WA9NHQ back in the, in the day, in the North Shore Radio Club back when it started. No. And he lives in Glenview. He's still, you know, probably not too far from you. I think he's still active. Really? Really? Email him once in a while. I mean, we... My call was WA9NSO, and he was WA9NHQ, so we were in high school together. Oh, okay. Um, talk on 40 meters CW when we were uh, both novices. What was his last name? Did I'm trying to remember. Godi. Or... Oh, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, I know him. Uh, I just didn't know his call sign. He, he stopped being a member of a club. He's, he's sort of like his own free agent now. He's had a, he had a huge tower right next to Wagner Farm. I don't know if you know what that is. And uh, it blew down, and uh, but he's still there. I, I I see his wife every so often, uh, you know, at church or one thing or another. But he's um, he's he's still active. He just isn't a member of the club. Okay. The, to my chagrin, because I think he'd be a great guy to have along. Burned out. He's, Got smart. He burned his own. He built his own repeater. He has his own little world going on there. So, yeah. but he still does it, I guess. Yeah, sure. I know. I've met him. Know him. Memory lane, uh, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to call it a night. I, my kids just stuck their head in there and said, what is Hanukkah? That's oh, right. Yeah. You're in the middle of You're that, aren't you? in the middle of you? it, man. We are, we are, we are. And this is the, you know, getting into the good time where they're starting to see, is it still good present time or starting to get into socks and underwear? Yep. Yeah, so right. That's good. I heard, heard somebody on a podcast or, yeah, it must've been a podcast because I don't listen to radio anymore. That said, uh, so you know what, uh, maybe this is one of the comedy shows at night. You know, you know what Hanukkah means if you're a kid? It means your parents don't get the day off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, happy Hanukkah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, happy holidays to everyone. And, and again, thank you so much for joining us, Rob. Yeah. Notice yeah, that we are you. fully decorated for whatever this is. Any, any season back there, you're ready for everything. The roaming gnome yeah. is, is invisible yeah, behind he's the tinsel. Little, he's a little too covered up for, for my, uh, yeah, but yeah, Arvin's still there. Arvin's yeah. With his naked pig hey. beer sitting next to him. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, he is. Well, hopefully I'll see you all at uh, some place at Dayton okay. or something again. Bef- before you go, I need to get um, something here. Oh, you have to smile. Yeah, something for, Oh, yeah, just uh, sit up, address the, to, looking, have, this will be for, up, for titles and stuff. So I need it, uh, yeah, everybody looking happy with no titles, and then everybody looking happy with the main title, and uh, yeah, I'll just do that. And you got to get you smile. in there too, Gary. I'm not in the show. You're in the show. I, I'm I'm going to transition in, but you're not gone yet. Almost. Okay. You're scared. Well, I don't me. like the look here, but it's a... <laughs> I didn't get that with no. Uh... There we go. You went. Okay. You did a better big, one. Yeah, big smile. <laughs> That's perfect. There I, you go. I That's think perfect. I think I got everything that I need. I'm uh, okay. S- still weary from not getting any sleep last night, like you, David. So. Yeah, that's a not, not an uncommon uncommon uh, thing around here. And you know, David, what I what I found is um, an, an issue with doing these uh, extended post show conversations is yeah. that I put the close of the show in in post production. You didn't see the close. It, it, you know, it's get I did. Got some I, stuff. I watch it. I still right. watch but it. You did, but no one saw the close for this because it hasn't uh-huh. happened yet. So I do it in post. Right. I can't find them. You know, I'm searching up and down the timeline trying to find that spot in the show because I don't watch the oh, whole show. Oh, got over it, got again. it, got it. Yeah, <laughs> so it, gets, it gets hard yeah. to find. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I mean, I do eventually, but it it takes longer than I thought it would. So it's kind of an well. Issue. This this will be easy for tonight. Write down two hours and thirty thirty minutes, and it'll be somewhere after that because we're at two thirty four something now. Yeah, it'll be right wow. at about the uh, two hour mark. So yeah, yeah droned exactly. on an awful lot, huh? It's we su- do. Surprising, isn't thing. it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we have to do, we have to do one of those beep things or get a board for that. We did the first close and now we're going to do the rest of the show. Yeah. And we're up to, um, we're up to six, six viewers here on Facebook yep. of which once again, I'm one and I think you're the other. And I'm, I'm another, but there's been yeah. some other ones in there. Some folks who wanted to join the show, we'll, we'll get there for in, in, uh, in next, next season we'll, uh, Bring some guests in now and then. Yeah, I'll have to find That's, figure out how to do a dump, dump we don't, button. For we that. don't do seasons. You no, know, I know. I was kidding. But some podcasters do. They they declare seasons. Yeah, not going to do it. One of the reasons why they declare seasons is so, so they can have an off season. <laughs> then get out of there for a yeah. while. Yeah, stop. Yeah, whatever it. off. Always got on. It, got it. <clears throat> All right, David. I'm gonna say goodbye to you. Goodbye. Say goodbye to Rob. I'm going to push the, the goodbye button for everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you, thank guys. Thank you so much, once. Rob. No, thank you, guys. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Gary. And uh, if I can find the button, bye, everybody. Goodbye. And they're gone. And Skype, you did good. I'll give you an excellent. There you go. Once again, just you and me. And I've got TV to watch. So find the Facebook button. Goodbye, Facebook. Goodbye, hard drive.